The Angel of the Odd by Edgar Allan Poe This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Angel of the Odd An Extravaganza It was a chilly November afternoon. I had just consummated an unusually hearty dinner, of which the dyspeptic truffle formed not the least important item, and was sitting alone in the dining-room, with my feet upon the fender, and at my elbow a small table which I had rolled up to the fire, and upon which were some apologies for dessert, with some miscellaneous bottles of wine, spirit, and liqueur. In the morning I had been reading Glover's Leonidas, Wilkie's Epigoniad, Lamartine's Pilgrimage, Barlow's Columbiad, Tuckerman's Sicily, and Griswold's Curiosities. I am willing to confess, therefore, that I now felt a little stupid. I made effort to arouse myself by aid of frequent Lafitte, and, all failing, I betook myself to a stray newspaper in despair. Having carefully perused the column of Houses to Let and the column of Dogs Lost, and then the two columns of Wives and Apprentices Run Away, I attacked with great resolution the editorial matter, and, reading it from beginning to end, without understanding a syllable, conceived the possibility of its being Chinese, and so re-read it from the end to the beginning, but with no more satisfactory result. I was about throwing away, in disgust, this folio of four pages happy work which not even critics criticize, when I felt my attention somewhat aroused by the paragraph which follows. The avenues to death are numerous and strange. A London paper mentions the decease of a person from a singular cause. He was playing at Puff the Dart, which is played with a long needle inserted in some worsted and blown at a target through a tin tube. He placed the needle at the wrong end of the tube, and drawing his breath strongly to puff the dart forward with force, drew the needle into his throat. It entered the lungs, and in a few days killed him. Upon seeing this, I fell into a great rage, without exactly knowing why. This thing, I exclaimed, is a contemptible falsehood, a poor hoax, the lease of the invention of some pitiable penny-liner, of some wretched concoctor of accidents in cocaine. These fellows, knowing the extravagant gullibility of the age, set their wits to work in the imagination of improbable possibilities, of odd accidents, as they term them. But to a reflecting intellect, like mine, I added in parentheses, putting my forefinger unconsciously to the side of my nose, to a contemplative understanding such as myself possess, it seems evident at once that the marvelous increase of late in these odd accidents is by far the oddest accident of all. For my own part, I intend to believe nothing henceforward that has anything of the singular about it. Mind God, then, what a fool you be for that, replied one of the most remarkable voices I had ever heard. At first I took it for a rumbling in my ears, such as a man sometimes experiences when getting very drunk. But, upon second thought, I considered the sound as more nearly resembling that which proceeds from an empty barrel beaten with a big stick. And, in fact, this I should have concluded it to be, but for the articulation of the syllables and words. I am by no means naturally nervous, and the very few glasses of Lafitte which I had sipped served to embolden me no little, so that I felt nothing of trepidation, but merely uplifted my eyes with a leisurely movement, and looked carefully around the room for the intruder. I could not, however, perceive any one at all. Humph! resumed the voice as I continued my survey. You must be so drunk as the pig, then, for not see me as I sit here at your side. Hereupon I bethought me of looking immediately before my nose, and there, sure enough, confronting me at the table, sat a personage nondescript, though not altogether indescribable. His body was a wine-pipe, or a rum-puncheon, or something of that character, and had a truly Falstaffian air. In its nether extremity were inserted two kegs, which seemed to answer all the purposes of legs. For arms there dangled from the upper portion of the carcass two tolerably long bottles, with the necks outward for hands. All the head that I saw the monster possessed of 
was one of those Hessian canteens which resemble a large snuff-box with a hole in the middle of the lid. This canteen, with a funnel on top like a cavalier lid slouched over the eyes, was set on edge upon the puncheon, with the hole toward myself, and through this hole, which seemed puckered up like the mouth of a very precise old maid, the creature was emitting certain rumbling and grumbling noises which he evidently intended for intelligible talk. I say, said he, you must pee drunk as the pig, for zit there, and not zee me zit ear, and I say do, you must be pigger fool as the goose, for to disbelieve what is print in the print. Tis is truth, that it is, every word of it. Who are you, pray, said I, with much dignity, although somewhat puzzled. How did you get here? And what is it you are talking about? As for our I come ear, replied the figure, that is none of your peasness. And as for what I be talking about, I be talk about what I think proper. And as for who I be, why that is the very thing I come here for to let you see for yourself. You are a drunken vagabond, said I, and I shall ring the bell and order my footman to kick you out on the street. He he he, said the fellow. Hoo hoo hoo, that you can't do. Can't do, said I. What do you mean? I can't do what? Bring Tipel, he replied, attempting a grin with his little villainous mouth. Upon this I made an effort to get up, in order to put my threat into execution, but the ruffian just reached across the table very deliberately, and hitting me a tap on the forehead with the neck of one of the long bottles, knocked me back into the armchair from which I had half arisen. I was utterly astounded, and for a moment was quite at a loss what to do. In the meantime he continued his talk. You see, said he, it is the best for zit still. And now you shall know who I be. Look at me. See, I am the angel of the odd. And odd enough, too, I ventured to reply. But I was always under the impression that an angel had wings. The wing, he cried, highly incensed. What I be do be the wing? My God, do you take me for a chicken? No, oh no, I replied, much alarmed. You are no chicken, certainly not. Well, then, sit still and behave yourself, or I'll lap you again with me fist. It is the chicken ab the wing, und the owl ab the wing, und the imp ab the wing, und the ab tufel ab the wing. The angel ab not the wing, and I am the angel of the odd. And your business with me at present is... My business, ejaculated the thing. Why, what is a low-bred puppy you must be for to ask a gentleman and an angel about his business? This language was rather more than I could bear, even from an angel. So, plucking up courage, I seized a salt cellar, which lay within reach, and hurled it at the head of the intruder. Either he dodged, however, or my aim was inaccurate, for all I accomplished was the demolition of the crystal, which protected the dial of the clock upon the mantelpiece. As for the angel, he evinced his sense of my assault, by giving me two or three hard consecutive raps upon my forehead as before. These reduced me at once to submission, and I am almost ashamed to confess that either through pain or vexation there came a few tears to my eyes. Mein Gott, said the angel of the odd, apparently very much softened at my distress, Mein Gott, the man is either very drunk or very sorry. You must not drink it so strong. You must put the water in the wine. Here, drink this like a good fellow, and don't cry now, don't. Hereupon the angel of the odd replenished my goblet, which was about a third full of port, with a colorless fluid that he poured from one of his hand bottles. I observed that these bottles had labels around their necks, and that these labels were inscribed Kirschenwasser. The considerable kindness of the angel mollified me in no little measure, and, aided by the water which he diluted in my port more than once, I at length regained sufficient temper to listen to his very extraordinary discourse. I cannot pretend to recount all that he told me, but I gleaned from what he said that he was the genius who presided over the contretemps of mankind, and whose business it was to bring about the odd accidents which are continually astonishing the skeptic. Once or twice, upon my venturing to express my total incredulity in respect to his pretensions, he grew very angry indeed, so that at length I considered it the wiser policy to say nothing at all and let him have his own way. He talked on, therefore, at great length, while I merely leaned back in my chair with my eyes shut, and amused myself with munching raisins and flipping the stems around the room. But, by and by, the angel suddenly construed this behavior of mine into contempt. He arose in a terrible passion, 
slouched his funnel down over his eyes, swore a vast oath, uttered a threat of some character which I did not precisely comprehend, and finally made me a low bow and departed, wishing me, in the language of the archbishop in Gilblas, Ber coupe de bonheur et un peu plus de bon sens. His departure afforded me relief. The very few glasses of Lafitte that I had sipped had the effect of rendering me drowsy, and I felt inclined to have a nap of some fifteen or twenty minutes, as is my custom after dinner. At six I had an appointment of consequence, which it was quite indispensable that I should keep. The policy of insurance for my dwelling-house had expired the day before, and, some dispute having arisen, it was agreed that at six I should meet the board of directors at the company and settle the terms of a renewal. Glancing upward at the clock on the mantelpiece, for I felt too drowsy to take out my watch, I had the pleasure to find that I still had twenty-five minutes to spare. It was half-past five. I could easily walk to the insurance office in five minutes, and my usual siestas had never been known to exceed five and twenty. I felt sufficiently safe, therefore, and composed myself to my slumbers forthwith. Having completed them to my satisfaction, I again looked toward the timepiece, and was half inclined to believe in the possibility of odd accidents, when I found that, instead of my ordinary fifteen or twenty minutes, I had been dozing only three, for it still wanted seven and twenty of the appointed hour. I betook myself again to my nap, and at length a second time awoke, when to my utter amazement it still wanted twenty-seven minutes of six. I jumped up to examine the clock, and found that it had ceased running. My watch informed me that it was half-past seven, and, of course, having slept two hours, I was too late for my appointment. It will make no difference, I said. I can call at the office in the morning and apologize. In the meantime, what can be the matter with the clock? Upon examining it, I discovered that one of the raisin stems which I had been flipping around the room during the discourse of the Angel of the Odd had flown through the fractured crystal, and lodging, singularly enough, in the keyhole, with an end projecting outward, had thus arrested the revolution of the minute hand. Ah, said I, I see how it is. This thing speaks for itself. A natural accident, a natural accident, such as will happen now and then. I gave the matter no further consideration, and at my usual hour retired to bed. Here, having placed a candle upon a reading stand at the bed head, and having made an attempt to peruse some pages of the omnipresence of the deity, I unfortunately fell asleep in less than twenty seconds, leaving the light burning as it was. My dreams were terrifically disturbed by visions of the angel of the odd. Methought he stood at the foot of the couch, drew aside the curtains, and in the hollow detestable tones of a rum puncheon, menaced me with the bitterest vengeance for the contempt with which I had treated him. He concluded a long harangue by taking off his funnel cap, inserting the tube into my gullet, and thus deluging me with an ocean of Kirschen water, which he poured in a continuous flood from one of the long-necked bottles that stood him instead of an arm. My agony was at length insufferable, and I awoke just in time to perceive that a rat had ran off with a lighted candle from the stand, but not in season to prevent his making his escape with it through the hole. Very soon a strong suffocating odor assailed my nostrils. The house, I clearly perceived, was on fire. In a few minutes the blaze broke forth with violence, and in an incredibly brief period the entire building was wrapped in flames. All egress to my chamber except through a window, was cut off. The crowd, however, quickly procured and raised a long ladder. By means of this I was descending rapidly, and in apparent safety, when a huge hog, about whose rotund stomach, and indeed about whose whole air and physiognomy, there was something which reminded me of the angel of the odd. When this hog, I say, which hitherto had been quietly slumbering in the mud, took it suddenly into his head that his left shoulder needed scratching, and could find no more convenient rubbing post than that was afforded by the foot of the ladder. In an instant I was precipitated, and had the misfortune to fracture my arm. This accident, with the loss of my insurance, and with the more serious loss of my hair, the whole of which had been singed off by the fire, predisposed me to serious impressions, so that finally I made up my mind to take a wife. There was a rich widow, disconsolate for the loss of her seventh husband, and to her wounded spirit I offered the balm of my vows. She yielded a reluctant consent to my prayers. I knelt at her feet in gratitude and adoration. She blushed, and bowed her luxuriant tresses into close contact with those supplied me temporarily by Grand Jean. I know not how the entanglement took place, but so it was. 
Ire rose with a shining pate, wigless, she in disdain and wrath, half buried in alien hair. Thus ended my hopes of the widow by an accident which could not have been anticipated to be sure, but which the natural sequence of events had brought about. Without despairing, however, I undertook the siege of a less implacable heart. The fates were again propitious for a brief period, but again a trivial incident interfered. Meeting my betrothed in an avenue thronged with the elite of the city, I was hastening to greet her with one of my best-considered bows, when a small particle of some foreign matter lodging in the corner of my eye rendered me for the moment completely blind. Before I could recover my sight, the lady of my love had disappeared, irreparably affronted at what she chose to consider my premeditated rudeness in passing by her ungreeted. While I stood bewildered at the suddenness of this incident, which might have happened nevertheless to any one under the sun, and while I still continued incapable of sight, I was accosted by the angel of the odd, who proffered me his aid with a civility which I had no reason to expect. He examined my disordered eye, and with much gentleness and skill, informed me that I had a drop in it, and, whatever a drop was, took it out, and afforded me relief. I considered it high time to die, since fortune had so determined to persecute me, and accordingly made my way to the nearest river. Here, divesting myself of my clothes, for there is no reason why we cannot die as we were born, I threw myself headlong into the current, the sole witness of my fate being a solitary crow that had been seduced into the eating of brandy-saturated corn, and so had staggered away from its fellows. No sooner had I entered the water than this bird took it into its head to fly away with the most indispensable portion of my apparel. Postponing, therefore, for the present my suicidal design, I just slipped my nether extremities into the sleeves of my coat, and betook myself to a pursuit of the felon with all the nimbleness which the case required and the circumstances would admit. But my evil destiny attended me still, as I ran at full speed, with my nose up in the atmosphere, and intent only upon the purloiner of my property, I suddenly perceived that my feet rested no longer on terra firma. The fact is, I had thrown myself over a precipice, and should inevitably have been dashed to pieces but for my good fortune in grasping the end of a long guide rope, which descended from a passing balloon. As soon as I sufficiently recovered my senses to comprehend the terrific predicament in which I stood, or rather hung, I exerted all the power of my lungs to make that predicament known to the aeronaut overhead. But for a long time I exerted myself in vain. Either the fool could not, or the villain would not perceive me. Meantime the machine rapidly soared, while my strength even more rapidly failed. I was soon upon the point of resigning myself to my fate, and dropping quietly to the sea, when my spirits were suddenly revived by hearing a hollow voice from above, which seemed to be lazily humming an opera air. Looking up, I perceived the angel of the odd. He was leaning with his arms folded over the rim of the car, and with a pipe in his mouth, at which he puffed leisurely, seemed to be upon excellent terms with himself in the universe. I was much too exhausted to speak, so I merely regarded him with an imploring air. For several minutes, although he looked me full in the face, he said nothing. At length, removing carefully his meerschaum from the right to the left corner of his mouth, he condescended to speak. Who be you? he asked. And what the tuffel you be to dare? To this piece of impudence, cruelty, and affectation, I could reply only by ejaculating the monosyllable, Help! Help! echoed the ruffian. Not I. That is the bother. Help yourself, and be damned. With these words, he let fall a heavy bottle of Kirschenwasser, which, dropping precisely on the crown of my head, caused me to imagine that my brains were entirely knocked out. Impressed with this idea, I was about to relinquish my hold and give up the ghost with a good grace, when I was arrested by the cry of the angel, who bade me hold on. Hold on, he said. Don't be in the uri, don't. Will you be take the other bottle, or have you got the zober yet, and come to your senses? I made haste thereupon to nod my head twice, once in the negative, meaning thereby that I would prefer not taking the other bottle at present, and once in the affirmative, intending thus to imply that I was sober and had positively come to my senses. By these means I somewhat softened the angel. "'Und you believe, then?' he inquired. "'At the last?' "'You believe, then, in the possibility of the odd?' I again nodded my head in assent. "'Und you have belief in me, the angel of the odd?' 
I nodded again. Would you acknowledge that you be the blind, drunk, and the fool? I nodded once more. Put your right hand into your left hand breeches pocket then, in token of your full submission unto the angel of the odd. This thing, for very obvious reasons, I found it quite impossible to do. In the first place, my left arm had been broken in my fall from the ladder, and, therefore, had I let go of my hold with the right hand, I must have let go altogether. In the second place, I could have no breeches until I came across the crow. I was therefore obliged, much to my regret, to shake my head in the negative, intending thus to give the angel to understand that I found it inconvenient, just at that moment, to comply with his very reasonable demand. No sooner, however, had I ceased shaking my head, than, "'Go to the tufel, then!' roared the angel of the odd. In pronouncing these words, he drew a sharp knife across the guide-rope by which I was suspended, and as we then happened to be precisely over my own house, which, during my peregnations, had been handsomely rebuilt, it so occurred that I tumbled headlong down the ample chimney and alit upon the dining-room hearth. Upon coming to my senses, for the fall had very thoroughly stunned me, I found it about four o'clock in the morning. I lay outstretched where I had fallen from the balloon. My head groveled in the ashes of an extinguished fire, while my feet reposed upon the wreck of a small table, overthrown, and amid the fragments of a miscellaneous dessert, intermingled with a newspaper, some broken glass and shattered bottles, and an empty jug of the Shiedam Kirsenwasser. Thus revenged himself, the Angel of the Odd. End of The Angel of the Odd by Edgar Allan Poe Aunt Cynthia's Persian Cat by L. M. Montgomery This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Missy, Guangzhou, China. Aunt Cynthia's Persian Cat From Further Chronicles of Avonlea Max always blesses the animal when it is referred to, and I don't deny that things have worked together for good after all. But when I think of the anguish of mind which Ismay and I underwent on account of that abominable cat, it is not a blessing that arises uppermost in my thoughts. I never was fond of cats, although I admit they are well enough in their place, and I can worry along comfortably with a nice matronly old tabby who can take care of herself and be of some use in the world. As for Ismay, she hates cats, and always did. But Aunt Cynthia, who adored them, never could bring herself to understand that any one could possibly dislike them. She firmly believed that Ismay and I really liked cats deep down in our hearts, but that, owing to some perverse twist in our moral natures, we would not own up to it, but willfully persisted in declaring we didn't. Of all cats, I loathed that white Persian cat of Aunt Cynthia's. And indeed, as we always suspected and finally proved, Aunt herself looked upon the creature with more pride than affection. She would have taken ten times the comfort in a good common puss that she did in that spoiled beauty. But a Persian cat with a recorded pedigree and a market value of one hundred dollars tickled Aunt Cynthia's pride of possession to such an extent that she deluded herself into believing that the animal really was the apple of her eye. It had been presented to her when a kitten by a missionary nephew who had brought it all the way home from Persia and for the next three years Aunt Cynthia's household existed to wait on that cat hand and foot. It was snow-white, with a bluish-gray spot on the tip of its tail, and it was blue-eyed and deaf and delicate. Aunt Cynthia was always worrying lest it should take hold and die. Ismay and I used to wish that it would. We were so tired of hearing about it and its whims. But we did not say so to Aunt Cynthia. She would probably have never spoken to us again, and there was no wisdom in offending Aunt Cynthia. When you have an unencumbered aunt with a fat bank account, it is just as well to keep on good terms with her if you can. Besides, we really liked Aunt Cynthia very much, at times. Aunt Cynthia was one of those rather exasperating people who nag at and find fault with you until you think you are justified in hating them, and who then turn round and do something really so nice and kind for you that you feel as if you are compelled to love them dutifully instead. 
So we listened meekly when she discoursed on Fatima, the cat's name was Fatima, and if it was wicked of us to wish for the latter's decease, well, we were well punished for it later on. One day in November, Aunt Cynthia came sailing out to Spencervale. She really came in a phaeton, drawn by a fat grey pony, but somehow Aunt Cynthia always gave you the impression of a full-rigged ship coming gallantly on before a favourable wind. That was a Jonah day for us all through. Everything had gone wrong. Ismay had spilled grease on her velvet coat, and the fit of the new blouse I was making was hopelessly askew, and the kitchen stove smoked, and the bread was sour. Moreover, Hulda Jane Keeson, our tried and trusted old family nurse and cook and general boss, had what she called the realgy in her shoulder, and though Hulda Jane is as good an old creature as ever lived, when she has the realgy, other people who are in the house want to get out of it, and if they can't, feel about as comfortable as St. Lawrence on his gridiron. And on top of this came Aunt Cynthia's call and request. "'Dear me,' said Aunt Cynthia, sniffing, "'don't I smell smoke? You girls must manage your range very badly. Mine never smokes. But it is no more than one might expect when two girls try to keep house without a man about the place.' "'We get along very well without a man about the place,' I said loftily. Max hadn't been in for four whole days, and though nobody wanted to see him particularly, I couldn't help wondering why. Men are nuisances. I dare say you would like to pretend you think so, said Aunt Cynthia, aggravatingly. But no woman ever does really think so, you know. I imagine that pretty Anne Shirley, who is visiting Ella Kimball, doesn't. I saw her and Dr. Irving out walking this afternoon, looking very well satisfied with themselves. If you dilly-dally much longer, Sue, you will let Max slip through your fingers yet. That was a tactful thing to say to me, who had refused Max Irving so often that I had lost count. I was furious, and so I smiled most sweetly on my maddening aunt. "'Dear aunt, how amusing of you,' I said smoothly. "'You talk as if I wanted Max.' "'So you do,' said Aunt Cynthia. "'If so, why should I have refused him time and again?' I asked smilingly. Right well Aunt Cynthia knew I had, Max always told her. "'Goodness alone knows why,' said Aunt Cynthia, "'but you may do it once too often and find yourself taken at your word. "'There is something very fascinating about this Anne Shirley.' "'Indeed there is,' I assented. "'She has the loveliest eyes I ever saw. "'She would be just the wife for Max, and I hope he will marry her.' Hm, said Aunt Cynthia. "'Well, I won't entice you into telling any more fibs. "'And I didn't drive out here to-day, in all this wind, "'to talk sense into you concerning Max.' I'm going to Halifax for two months, and I want you to take charge of Fatima for me while I am away. Fatima! I exclaimed. Yes, I don't dare to trust her with the servants. Mind you always warm her milk before you give it to her, and don't on any account let her run out of doors. I looked at Ismay, and Ismay looked at me. I knew we were in for it. To refuse would mortally offend on Cynthia. Besides, if I betrayed any unwillingness, Aunt Cynthia would be sure to put it down to grumpiness over what she had said about Max and rub it in for years. But I ventured to ask, what if anything happens to her while you are away? It is to prevent that I'm leaving her with you, said Aunt Cynthia. You simply must not let anything happen to her. It will do you good to have a little responsibility, and you will have a chance to find out what an adorable creature Fatima really is. Well, that is all settled. I'll send Fatima out tomorrow. "'You can take care of that horrid Fatima beast yourself,' said Ismay, when the door closed behind Aunt Cynthia. "'I won't touch her with a yardstick. You had no business to say we'd take her.' "'Did I say we would take her?' I demanded crossly. "'Aunt Cynthia took our consent for granted, and you know as well as I do we couldn't have refused. "'So what is the use of being grouchy? "'If anything happens to her, Aunt Cynthia will hold us responsible,' said Ismay darkly. "'Do you think Anne Shirley is really engaged to Gilbert Blythe?' I asked curiously. "'I've heard that she was,' said Ismay absently. "'Does she eat anything but milk? Will it do to give her mice?' "'Oh, I guess so. But do you think Max has really fallen in love with her?' "'I dare say. What a relief it will be for you if he has.' "'Oh, of course,' I said frostily. "'Anne Shirley or Anne anybody else is perfectly welcome to Max if she wants him. I certainly do not.' Ismay Mead, if that stove doesn't stop smoking, I shall fly into bits. This is a detestable day. I hate that creature. Oh, you shouldn't talk like that when you don't even know her, protested Ismay. Everyone says Anne Shirley is lovely. 
I was talking about Fatima, I cried in a rage. Oh, said Ismay. Ismay is stupid at times. I thought the way she said oh was inexcusably stupid. Fatima arrived the next day. Max brought her out in a covered basket, lined with padded crimson satin. Max likes cats and Aunt Cynthia. He explained how we were to treat Fatima, and when Ismay had gone out of the room, Ismay always went out of the room when he, she knew I particularly wanted her to remain, he proposed to me again. Of course I said no, as usual, but I was rather pleased. Max had been proposing to me about every two months for two years. Sometimes, as in this case, he went three months, and then I always wondered why. I concluded that he could not be really interested in Anne Shirley, and I was relieved. I didn't want to marry Max, but it was pleasant and convenient to have him around, and we would miss him dreadfully if any other girl snapped him up. He was so useful and always willing to do anything for us, nail a shingle on the roof, drive us into town, put down carpets, in short, a very present help in all our troubles. So I just beamed on him when I said no. Max began counting on his fingers. When he got as far as eight, he shook his head and began over again. "'What is it?' I asked. "'I'm trying to count up how many times I have proposed to you,' he said. "'But I can't remember whether I asked you to marry me that day we dug up the garden or not. If I did, it makes—' "'No, you didn't,' I interrupted. "'Well, that makes it eleven, said Max reflectively. "'Pretty near the limit, isn't it? My manly pride will not allow me to propose to the same girl more than twelve times. So, the next time will be the last, Sue Darling.' "'Oh,' I said, a trifle flatly. I forgot to resent his calling me darling. I wondered if things wouldn't be rather dull when Max gave up proposing to me. It was the only excitement I had. But of course it would be best, and he couldn't go on at it forever. So, by the way of gracefully dismissing the subject, I asked him what Miss Shirley was like. "'Very sweet girl,' said Max. "'You know I always admired those grey-eyed girls with that splendid Titian hair.' I am dark, with brown eyes. Just then I detested Max. I got up and said I was going to get some milk for Fatima. I found Ismay in a rage in the kitchen. She had been up in the garret, and a mouse had run across her foot. Mice always get on Ismay's nerves. We need a cat badly enough, she fumed, but not a useless pampered thing like Fatima. That garret is literally swarming with mice. You'll not catch me going up there again. Fatima did not prove such a nuisance as we had feared. Hulda Jane liked her, and Ismay, in spite of her declaration that she would have nothing to do with her, looked after her comfort scrupulously. She even used to get up in the middle of the night and go out to see if Fatima was warm. Max came in every day, and, being around, gave us good advice. Then one day, about three weeks after Aunt Cynthia's departure, Fatima disappeared, just simply disappeared as if she had been dissolved into thin air. We left her one afternoon, curled up asleep in her basket by the fire, under Hulda Jane's eye, while we went out to make a call. When we came home, Fatima was gone. Hulda Jane wept and was as one whom the gods had made mad. She vowed that she had never let Fatima out of her sight the whole time, save once for three minutes when she ran up to the garret for some summer savory. When she came back, the kitchen door had blown open and Fatima had vanished. Ismay and I were frantic. We ran about the garden and through the outhouses and the woods behind the house like wild creatures, calling Fatima, but in vain. Then Ismay sat down on the front doorsteps and cried. She's got out and she'll catch her death of cold and Aunt Cynthia will never forgive us. I'm going for Max, I declared. So I did, through the spruce woods and over the field as fast as my feet could carry me, thanking my stars that there was a Max to go to in such a predicament. Max came over and we had another search, but without result. Days passed, but we did not find Fatima. I would certainly have gone crazy had it not been for Max. He was worth his weight in gold during the awful week that followed. We did not dare advertise, lest Aunt Cynthia should see it. But we inquired far and wide for a white Persian cat with a blue spot on its tail, and offered a reward for it. But nobody had seen it, although people kept coming to the house night and day with every kind of cat in baskets, wanting to know if it was the one we had lost. We shall never see Fatima again, I said hopelessly to Max and Ismay one afternoon. I had just turned away an old woman with a big yellow tommy, which she insisted must be ours. Cause it come to our place, mum, a yowlin' fearful mum, and it don't belong to nobody not down Grafton way, mum. I'm afraid you won't, said Max. 
She must have perished from exposure long ere this. "'Aunt Cynthia will never forgive us,' said Ismay dismally. "'I had a presentiment of trouble the moment that cat came into this house.' We had never heard of this presentiment before, but Ismay is good at having presentiments, after things happen. "'What shall we do?' I demanded helplessly. "'Max, can't you find some way out of this scrape for us?' "'Advertise in the Charlottetown papers for a white Persian cat,' suggested Max. "'Someone may have one for sale. If so, you must buy it and palm it off on your good aunt as Fatima. She's very short-sighted, so it would be quite possible.' "'But Fatima has a blue spot on her tail,' I said. "'You must advertise for a cat with a blue spot on its tail,' said Max. "'It will cost a pretty penny,' said Ismay dolefully. "'Fatima was valued at one hundred dollars.' <sighs> "'We must take the money we have been saving for our new furs,' I said sorrowfully. "'There's no other way out of it. "'It will cost us a good deal more if we lose Aunt Cynthia's favor. She is quite capable of believing that we have made away with Fatima deliberately and with malice aforethought. So we advertised. Max went to town and had the notice inserted in the most important daily. We asked anyone who had a white Persian cat with a blue spot on the tip of its tail to dispose of, to communicate with M.I. care of the enterprise. We really did not have much hope that anything would come of it, so we were surprised and delighted over the letter Max brought from home from town four days later. It was a typewritten screed from Halifax, stating that the writer had for sale a white Persian cat answering to our description. The price was a hundred and ten dollars, and if M. I. cared to go to Halifax and inspect the animal, it would be found at 110 Hollis Street by inquiring for Persian. "'Temper your joy, my friends,' said Ismay gloomily. "'The cat may not suit. The blue spot may be too big or too small or not in the right place.' I consistently refuse to believe that any good thing can come out of this deplorable affair. Just at this moment there was a knock at the door, and I hurried out. The postmaster's boy was there with a telegram. I tore it open, glanced at it, and dashed back into the room. "'What is it now?' cried Ismay, beholding my face. I held out the telegram. It was from Aunt Cynthia. She had wired us to send Fatima to Halifax by express immediately. For the first time Max did not seem ready to rush into the breach with a suggestion. It was I who spoke first. Max, I said imploringly, you'll see us through this, won't you? Neither Ismay nor I can rush off to Halifax at once. You must go tomorrow morning. Go right to 110 Hollis Street and ask for Persian. If the cat looks enough like Fatima, buy it and take it to Aunt Cynthia. If it doesn't... But it must. You'll go, won't you? "'That depends,' said Max. I stared at him. This was so unlike Max. "'You're sending me on a nasty errand,' he said coolly. "'How do I know that Aunt Cynthia will be deceived after all, even if she be short-sighted? Buying a cat in a poke is a huge risk. And if she should see through the scheme, I shall be in a pretty mess.' "'Oh, Max,' I said, on the verge of tears. "'Of course,' said Max, looking meditatively into the fire. If I were really one of the family, or had any reasonable prospect of being so, I would not mind so much. It would be all in the day's work then. But as it is, Ismay got up and went out of the room. Oh, Max, please, I said. Will you marry me, Sue? demanded Max sternly. If you will agree, I'll go to Halifax and beard the lion in his den unflinchingly. If necessary, I will take a black street cat to Aunt Cynthia and swear that it is Fatima. I'll get you out of the scrape, if I have to prove that you never had Fatima, that she is safe in your possession at the present time, and that there never was such an animal as Fatima anyhow. I'll do anything, say anything, but it must be for my future wife. Will nothing else content you? I said helplessly. Nothing. I thought hard. Of course Max was acting abominably, but, but he really was a dear fellow, and this was the twelfth time. And there was Anne Shirley. I knew in my secret soul that life would be a dreadfully dismal thing if Max were not around somewhere. Besides, I would have married him long ago had not Aunt Cynthia thrown us so pointedly at each other's heads ever since he came to Spencervale. Very well, I said crossly. Max left for Halifax in the morning. Next day we got a wire saying it was all right. The evening of the following day he was back in Spencervale. Ismay and I put him in a chair and glared at him impatiently. 
Max began to laugh, and laughed until he turned blue. "'I'm glad it's so amusing,' said Ismay severely. "'If Sue and I could see the joke, it might be more so.' "'Dear little girls, have patience with me,' implored Max. "'If you knew what it cost me to keep a straight face in Halifax, "'you would forgive me for breaking out now.' "'We forgive you, but for pity's sake tell us all about it,' I cried. "'Well, as soon as I arrived in Halifax, I hurried to 110 Hollis Street. "'But see here, didn't you tell me your aunt's address was 10 Pleasant Street?' "'So it is. "'Tisn't. "'You look at the address on a telegram next time you get one.' She went a week ago to visit another friend who lives at 110 Hollis. Max! It's a fact. I rang the bell and was just going to ask the maid for Persian when your Aunt Cynthia herself came through the hall and pounced on me. Max, she said, have you brought Fatima? No, I answered, trying to adjust my wits to this new development as she towed me into the library. No, I, I just came to Halifax on a little matter of business. "'Dear me,' said Aunt Cynthia crossly, "'I don't know what those girls mean. "'I wired them to send Fatima at once, "'and she has not come yet, "'and I am expecting a call every minute "'from someone who wants to buy her.' "'Oh,' I murmured, mining deeper every minute. "'Yes,' went on your aunt, "'there is an advertisement in the Charlottetown Enterprise "'for a Persian cat, and I answered it. "'Fatima is really quite a charge, you know, "'and so apt to die and be a dead loss. "'Did your aunt mean a pun, girls?' "'And so, although I am considerably attached to her, I have decided to part with her. "'By this time I had got my second wind, and I promptly decided that a judicious mixture of the truth was the thing required. "'Well, of all the curious coincidences!' I exclaimed. "'Why, Miss Ridley, it was I who advertised for a Persian cat, on Sue's behalf. "'She and Ismay have decided that they want a cat like Fatima for themselves.' "'You should have seen how she beamed. "'She said she knew you always really liked cats, "'only you would never own up to it. "'We clinched the dicker then and there. "'I passed her over your hundred and ten dollars. "'She took the money without turning a hair. "'And now you are the joint owners of Fatima. "'Good luck to your bargain.' "'Mean old thing,' sniffed Esmay. "'She meant Aunt Cynthia, "'and remembering our shabby furs, "'I didn't disagree with her. "'But there is no Fatima,' I said dubiously. "'How shall we account for her when Aunt Cynthia comes home?' "'Well, your aunt isn't coming home for a month yet. "'When she comes you'll have to tell her that the cat is lost, "'but you needn't say when it happened. "'As for the rest, Fatima is your property now, "'so Aunt Cynthia can't grumble. "'But she will have a poorer opinion than ever "'of your fitness to run a house alone.' "'When Max left I went to the window to watch him down the path. "'He was really a handsome fellow, and I was proud of him.' At the gate he turned to wave me good-bye, and as he did he glanced upward. Even at that distance I saw the look of amazement on his face. Then he came bolting back. "'Ismay, the house is on fire!' I shrieked, as I flew to the door. "'Sue!' cried Max. "'I saw Fatima, or her ghost, at the garret window a moment ago.' "'Nonsense!' I cried. But Ismay was already halfway up the stairs, and we followed. Straight to the garret we rushed. There sat Fatima, sleek and complacent, sunning herself in the window." Max laughed until the rafters rang. "'She can't have been up here all this time,' I protested, half tearfully. "'We would have heard her meowing.' "'But you didn't,' said Max. "'She would have died of the cold,' declared Ismay. "'But she hasn't,' said Max. "'Or starved,' I cried. "'The place is alive with mice,' said Max. "'No, girls, there is no doubt the cat has been up here the whole fortnight. "'She must have followed Hulda Jane up here unobserved that day. "'It's a wonder you didn't hear her crying.' if she did cry, but perhaps she didn't, and of course you sleep downstairs. To think you never thought of looking here for her. It has cost us over a hundred dollars, said Ismay, with a malevolent glance at the sleek Fatima. It has cost me more than that, I said as I turned to the stairway. Max held me back for an instant while Ismay and Fatima pattered down. Do you think it has cost too much, Sue? he whispered. I looked at him sideways. He was really a dear. Niceness fairly exhaled from him. No, I said. But when we're married, you will have to take care of Fatima. I won't. Dear Fatima, said Max gratefully. End of Aunt Cynthia's Persian Cat by L. M. Montgomery This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Dan Graves The Bottle Imp by Robert Louis Stevenson There is a man of the island of Hawaii whom I shall call Kiawe, for the truth is he still lives and his name must be kept secret. But the place of his birth was not far from Hanaunau, where the bones of Kiawe the Great lie hidden in a cave. This man was poor, brave, and active. He could read and write like a schoolmaster. He was a first-rate mariner besides, sailed for some time in the island steamers, and steered a whaleboat on the Hamakua coast. At length it came in Kiawe's mind to have a sight of the great world and foreign cities, and he shipped on a vessel bound to San Francisco. This is a fine town with a fine harbor and rich people uncountable, and in particular there is one hill which is covered with palaces. Upon this hill Keawe was one day taking a walk with his pocket full of money, viewing the great houses upon either hand with pleasure. What fine houses these are, he was thinking, and how happy must those people be who dwell in them and take no care for the morrow. The thought was in his mind when he came abreast of a house that was smaller than some others, but all finished and beautified like a toy. The steps of that house shone like silver, and the borders of the garden bloomed like garlands, and the windows were bright like diamond, and Kea was stopped and wondered at the excellence of all he saw. So stopping, he was aware of a man that looked forth upon him through a window so clear that Keawe could see him as you see a fish in a pool upon the reef. The man was elderly with a bald head and a black beard, and his face was heavy with sorrow, and he sighed bitterly. And the truth of it is that as Keawe looked in upon the man and the man looked out upon Keawe, each envied the other. All of a sudden, the man smiled and nodded and beckoned Keawe to enter and met him at the door of the house. This is a fine house of mine, said the man, and bitterly sighed. Would you not care to view the chambers? So he led Keao all over it, from the cellar to the roof, and there was nothing there that was not perfect of its kind, and Keao was astonished. Truly, said Keao, this is a beautiful house. If I lived in the like of it, I should be laughing all day long. How comes it, then, that you should be sighing? There is no reason, said the man, why you should not have a house in all points similar to this, and finer if you wish. You have some money, I suppose. I have fifty dollars, said Keawe, but a house like this will cost more than fifty dollars. The man made a computation. I am sorry you have no more, said he, for it may raise you trouble in the future, but it shall be yours at fifty dollars. The house? asked Keawe. No, not the house, replied the man, but the bottle. For I must tell you, although I appear to you so rich and fortunate, all my fortune in this house itself and its garden came out of a bottle not much bigger than a pint. This is it. And he opened a lock-fast place and took out a round-bellied bottle with a long neck. The glass of it was white like milk with changing rainbow colors in the grain. With inside something obscurely moved like a shadow and a fire. This is the bottle, said the man, and when Kiawe laughed, you do not believe me, he added. Try then for yourself, see if you can break it. So Kiawe took the bottle up and dashed it on the floor till he was weary, but it jumped on the floor like a child's ball and was not injured. This is a strange thing, said Kiawe, for by the touch of it, as well as by the look, the bottle should be of glass. Of glass it is, replied the man, sighing more heavily than ever. But the glass of it was tempered in the flames of hell. An imp lives in it, and that is the shadow we behold moving there, or so I should suppose. If any man buy this bottle, the imp is at his command. All that he desires, love, fame, money, houses like this house, a, or a city like this city, all are his at the word uttered. Napoleon had this bottle, and by it he grew to be the king of the world, but he sold it at the last and fell. Captain Cook had this bottle, and by it he found his way to so many islands, but he too sold it and was slain upon Hawaii. For once it is sold, the power goes and the protection, and unless a man remain content with what he has, ill will befall him. And yet you talk of selling it yourself, Keawe said. I have all I wish, and I am growing elderly, replied the man. There's one thing the imp cannot do, he cannot prolong life. And it would not be fair to conceal from you there is a drawback to the bottle, for if a man die before he sells it, he must burn in hell forever.
To be sure, that is a drawback and no mistake, cried Keawa. I would not meddle with the thing. I can do without a house, thank God, but there's one thing I could not be doing with one particle, and that is to be damned. Dear me, you must not run away with things, returned the man. All you have to do is use the power of the imp in moderation and then sell it to someone else as I do to you and finish your life in comfort. Well, I observed two things, said Keawa. All the time you keep sighing like a maid in love, that is one, and for the other you sell this bottle very cheap. I've already told you why I sigh, said the man. It is because I fear my health is breaking up, and as you said yourself, to die and go to the devil is a pity for anyone. As for why I sell so cheap, I must explain to you there is a peculiarity about the bottle. Long ago, when the devil brought it first upon earth, it was extremely expensive and was sold first of all to Prester John for many millions of dollars, but it cannot be sold at all unless sold at a loss. If you sell it for as much as you paid for it, back it comes to you again like a homing pigeon. It follows that the price has kept falling in all these centuries, and the bottle is now remarkably cheap. I bought it myself from one of my great neighbors on this hill, and the price I paid was only $90. I could sell it for as high as $89.99, but not a penny dearer or back the thing must come to me. Now about this, there are two bothers. First, when you offer a bottle so singular for $80, people suppose you to be jesting. And second, but there's no hurry about that, and I need not go into it. Only remember, it must be coined money that you sell it for. How am I to know that this is all true? asked Keawa. Some of it you can try at once, replied the man. Give me your fifty dollars, take the bottle, and wish your fifty dollars back into your pocket. If that does not happen, I pledge you my honor. I will cry off the bargain and restore your money. You're not deceiving me, said Keawa. The man bound himself with a great oath. Well, I will risk that much, said Keawa, for that can do no harm. And he paid over his money to the man, and the man handed him the bottle. Imp of the bottle, said Keawa, I want my fifty dollars back. And sure enough, he had scarce said the word before his pocket was as heavy as ever. To be sure, this is a wonderful bottle, said Keawa. And now good morning to you, my fine fellow, and the devil go with you for me, said the man. Hold on, said Keawa, I don't want any more of this fun. Here, take your bottle back. You have bought it for less than I paid for it, replied the man, rubbing his hands. It is yours now, and for my part, I am only concerned to see the back of you. And with that, he rang for his Chinese servant and had Keawa shown out of the house. Now, when Keawa was in the street and the bottle under his arm, he began to think. If all is true about this bottle, I may have made a losing bargain, thinks he. But perhaps the man was only fooling me. The first thing he did was to count his money. The sum was exact, $49 American money and one chili piece. That looks like the truth, said Keawa. Now I will try another part. The streets in that part of the city were as clean as a ship's decks, and though it was noon, there were no passengers. Keawa set the bottle in the gutter and walked away. Twice he looked back, and there was the milky, round-bellied bottle where he left it. A third time he looked back and turned a corner, but he had scarce done so when something knocked upon his elbow, and behold, it was the long neck sticking up, and as for the round belly, it was jammed into the pocket of his pilot coat. And that looks like the truth, said Keawa. The next thing he did was buy a corkscrew in a shop and go apart into a secret place in the fields, and there he tried to draw the cork, but as often as he put the screw in, out it came again, and the cork as whole as ever. This is some new sort of cork, said Keawa, and all at once he began to shake and sweat, for he was afraid of that bottle. On his way back to the port side, he saw a shop where a man sold shells and clubs from the wild islands, old heathen deities, old coined money, pictures from China and Japan, and all manner of things that sailors bring in their sea chests. And here he had an idea. So he went in and offered the bottle for a hundred dollars. The man of the shop laughed at him at first and offered him five, but indeed it was a curious bottle. Such glass was never blown in any human glassworks. So prettily the color shone under the milky white, and so strangely the shadow hovered in the midst. So after he had disputed a while after the manner of his kind, the shopman gave Keawa sixty silver dollars for the thing and set it on a shelf in the midst of his window. Now, said Keawa, I have sold that for sixty, which I bought for fifty, or, to say truth, a little less, because one of my dollars was from Chile. Now I shall know the truth upon another point. 
So he went back on board his ship, and when he opened his chest, there was the bottle, and had come more quickly than himself. Now Keawa had a mate on board whose name was Lopaka. What ails you, said Lopaka, that you stare in your chest? They were alone in the ship's forecastle, and Keawa bound him to secrecy and told all. This is a very strange affair, said Lopaka, and I fear you will be in trouble about this bottle, but there is one point very clear, that you are sure of the trouble, and you had better have the profit in the bargain. Make up your mind what you want with it, give the order, and if it is done as you desire, I will buy the bottle myself, for I have an idea of my own to get a schooner and go trading through the islands. That is not my idea, said Keawa, but to have a beautiful house and garden on the Kona coast where I was born, and sun shining in at the doors, flowers in the garden, glass in the windows, pictures on the walls, and toys and fine carpets on the tables for all the world like the house I was in this day, only a story higher, and with balconies all about like the king's palace, and to live there without care and make merry with my friends and relatives. Well, said Lopaka, let us carry it back with us to Hawaii. And if all comes true as you suppose, I will buy the bottle, as I said, and ask a schooner. Upon that they were agreed, and it was not long before the ship returned to Honolulu, carrying Kiawa and Lopaka and the bottle. They were scarce come ashore when they met a friend upon the beach who began at once to condole with Kiawa. I do not know what I am to be condoled about, said Kiawa. Is it possible you have not heard, said the friend, your uncle, that good old man, is dead, and your cousin, that beautiful boy, was drowned at sea? Keawa was filled with sorrow, and beginning to weep and to lament, he forgot all about the bottle. But Lopaka was thinking to himself, and presently, when Keawa's grief was a little abated, I've been thinking, said Lopaka, had not your uncle lands in Hawaii in the district of Kau? No, said Keawa, not in Kau. They are on the mountainside, a little way south of Hukina. Those lands will be yours now? asked Lopaka. And so they will, said Keawa, and began again to lament for his relatives. No, said Lopaka, do not lament at present. I have a thought in my mind. How if this should be do the doing of the bottle? For here is the place ready for your house. If this be so, cried Keawa, it is a very ill way to serve me by killing my relatives, but it may be indeed, for it was in just such a situation that I saw the house with my mind's eye. The house, however, is not yet built, said Lopaka. No, nor like to be, said Keawa, for though my uncle has some coffee and ava and bananas, it will not be more than will keep me in comfort in the rest of that land is the black lava. Let us go to the lawyer, said Lopaka. I have still this idea in my mind. Now when they came to the lawyers, it appeared Keawa's uncle had grown monstrous rich in the last days, and there was a fund of money. And here is the money for the house, cried Lopaka. If you are thinking of a new house, said the lawyer, here is the card of a new architect of whom they tell me great things. Better and better, cried Lopaka. Here is all made plain for us. Let us continue to obey orders. So they went to the architect, and he had drawings of houses on his table. You want something out of the way, said the architect. How do you like this? And he handed a drawing to Keawe. Now when Keawe set eyes on that drawing, he cried out aloud, for it was the picture of his thought exactly drawn. I am in for this house, thought he. Little as I like the way it comes to me, I am in for it now, and I may as well take the good along with the evil. So he told the architect all that he wished, and how he would have the house furnished, and about the pictures on the wall, and the knick-knacks on the tables, and he asked the man plainly for how much he would undertake the whole affair. The architect put many questions, and took his pen, and made a computation, and when he had done, he named the very sum that Kiawa had inherited. Lopaka and Kiawa looked at one another and nodded. It is quite clear, thought Kiawa, that I am to have this house whether or no. It comes from the devil, and I fear I will get little good by that, and of one thing I am sure, I will make no more wishes as long as I have this bottle. But with the house I am saddled, and I may as well take the good along with the evil. So he made his terms with the architect, and they signed a paper, and Kiawa and Lopaka took ship again and sailed to Australia, for it was concluded between them they should not interfere at all, but let the architect and the bottle imp to build and to adorn the house at their own pleasure. The voyage was a good voyage, only all the time Kiawa was holding in his breath, for he had sworn he would utter no more wishes and take no more favors from the devil. 
The time was up when they got back. The architect told them the house was ready, and Keawa and Lopaka took a ship in the hall and went down Konaway to view the house and see if all had been done fitly according to the thought that was in Keawa's mind. Now the house stood on the mountainside, visible to ships. Above, the forest ran up into the clouds of rain. Below, the black lava fell in cliffs where the kings of old lay buried. A garden bloomed about the house with every hue of flowers, and there was an orchard of papaya on the one hand and an orchard of breadfruit on the other, and right in front toward the sea a ship's mast had been rigged up and bore a flag. As for the house, it was three stories high with great chambers and broad balconies on each. The windows were of glass so excellent that it was as clear as water and as bright as day. All manner of furniture adorned the chambers. Pictures hung upon the wall in golden frames, pictures of ships and men fighting and of the most beautiful women, and of singular places nowhere in the world are there pictures of so bright a color as those Kiawa found hanging in his house. As for the knickknacks, they were extraordinary fine, chiming clocks and musical boxes, little men with nodding heads, books filled with pictures, weapons of price from all quarters of the world, and the most elegant puzzles to entertain the leisure of a solitary man. And as no one would care to live in such chambers, only to walk through and view them, the balconies were made so broad that a whole town might have lived upon them in delight, and Kiawa knew not which to prefer, whether the back porch where you got the land breeze and looked upon the orchards and the flowers, or the front balcony where you could drink the wind of the sea, and look down the steep wall of the mountain and see the hall going by once a week or so between Hukina and the hills of Pele, or the schooners plying up the coast for wood and ava and bananas. When they had viewed all, Keawa and Lopaka sat on the porch. Well, asked Lopaka, is it all as you designed? Words cannot utter it, said Keawa. It is better than I dreamed, and I am sick with satisfaction. There is but one thing to consider, said Lopaka. All this may be quite natural, and the bottle imp have nothing whatever to say to it. If I were to buy the bottle and get no schooner after all, I should have put my hand in the fire for nothing. I gave you my word, I know, but yet I think you would not grudge me one more proof. I have sworn I would take no more favors, said Keawa. I have gone already deep enough. This is no favor I am thinking of, replied Lopaka. It is only to see the imp himself. There is nothing to be gained by that, and so nothing to be ashamed of, and yet if I once saw him, I should be sure of the whole matter. So indulge me so far, and let me see the imp, and after that, here is the money in my hand, and I will buy it. There's only one thing I'm afraid of, said Keawa. The imp may be very ugly to view, and if you once set eyes upon him, you may be very undesirous of the bottle. I am a man of my word, said Lopaka, and here is the money betwixt us. Very well, replied Keawa. I have a curiosity myself, so come, let us have one look at you, Mr. Imp. Now, as soon as that was said, the imp looked out of the bottle, and in again, swift as a lizard, and there sat Keawa and Lopaka turned to stone. The night had quite come before either found a thought to say or voice to say it with, and then Lopaka pushed the money over and took the bottle. I'm a man of my word, said he, and had need to be so, or I would not touch this bottle with my foot. Well, I shall get my schooner and a dollar or two from my pocket, and then I will be rid of this devil as fast as I can, for to tell you the plain truth, the look of him has cast me down. Lopaka, said Kiawa, do not you think any worse of me than you can help. I know it is night and the road's bad, and the pass by the tomb's an ill place to go by so late. But I declare since I have seen that little face, I cannot eat or sleep or pray till it is gone from me. I will give you a lantern and a basket to put the bottle in, and any picture a fine thing in my house that takes your fancy, and be gone at once and go sleep at Hukina with Nahinu. Keawa, said Lopaka, many a man would take this ill, above all when I am doing you a turn so friendly as to keep my word and buy the bottle, and for that matter the night and the dark and the way by the tombs must be all tenfold more dangerous to a man with such a sin upon his conscience and such a bottle under his arm. But for my part I am so extremely terrified myself I have not the heart to blame you. Here I go then, and I pray God you may be happy in your house, and I fortunate with my schooner and both get to heaven in the end in spite of the devil and his bottle. 
So Lapaka went down the mountain. And Keawe stood in his front balcony and listened to the clink of the horse's shoes and watched the lantern go shining down the path and along the cliff of caves where the old dead are buried. And all the time he trembled and clasped his hands and prayed for his friend and gave glory to God that he himself was escaped out of that trouble. But the next day came very brightly, and that new house of his was so delightful to behold that he forgot his terrors. One day followed another, and Keawe dwelt there in perpetual joy. He had his place on the back porch. It was there he ate and lived and read the stories in the Honolulu newspapers. But when anyone came by, they would go in and view the chambers and the pictures. And the fame of the house went far and wide. It was called Kahale Nui, the great house in all Kona, and sometimes the bright house, for Keawe kept a Chinaman who was all day dusting and furbishing, and the glass and the gilt and the fine stuffs and the pictures shone as bright as the morning. As for Keawe himself, he could not walk in the chambers without singing. His heart was so enlarged, and when ships sailed by upon the sea, he would fly his colors on the mast. So time went by until one day Keawe went upon a visit as far as Kailua to certain of his friends. There he was well feasted and left as soon as he could the next morning and rode hard, for he was impatient to behold his beautiful house, and besides, the night then coming on was the night in which the dead of old days go abroad in the sides of Kona, and having already meddled with the devil, he was the more cheery of meeting with the dead. A little beyond Hanau now, looking far ahead, he was aware of a woman bathing in the edge of the sea, and she seemed a well-grown girl, but he thought no more of it. Then he saw her white shift flutter as she put it on, and then her red holoku, and by the time he came abreast of her, she was done with her toilet and had come up from the sea and stood by the trackside in her red holoku, and she was all freshened with the bath, and her eyes shone and were kind. Now Keawa no sooner beheld her than he drew rein. I thought I knew everyone in this country, said he. How comes it that I do not know you? I am Kakua, daughter of Kiano, said the girl, and I have just returned from Oahu. Who are you? I will tell you who I am in a little, said Kiawa, dismounting from his horse, but not now. For I have a thought in my mind, and if you knew who I was, you might have heard of me and would not give me a true answer. But tell me, first of all, one thing. Are you married? At this, Kokua laughed aloud. It is you who ask questions, she said. Are you married yourself? Indeed, Kokua, I am not, replied Keawe, and never thought to be until this hour. But here is the plain truth. I have met you here at the roadside, and I saw your eyes, which are like the stars, and my heart went to you as swift as a bird. And so now, if you want none of me, say so, and I will go on to my own place. But if you think me no worse than any other young man, say so too, and I will turn aside to your father's for the night, and tomorrow I will talk with the good man. Kokua said never a word, but she looked at the sea and laughed. Kokua said, Keawe, if you say nothing, I will take that for the good answer. So let us be stepping to your father's door. She went on ahead of him, still without speech, only sometimes she glanced back and glanced away again, and she kept the strings of her hat in her mouth. Now when they had come to the door, Keano came out on his veranda and cried out and welcomed Keawa by name. At that the girl looked over, for the fame of the great house had come to her ears, and to be sure it was a great temptation. All that evening they were very merry together, and the girl was as bold as brass under the eyes of her parents, and made a mock of Kiawa, for she had a quick wit. The next day he had a word with Kiano and found the girl alone. Kokua, said he, you made a mock of me all the evening, and it is still time to bid me go. I would not tell you who I was, because I have so fine a house, and I feared you would think too much of that house and too little of the man that loves you. Now you know all, and if you wish to have seen the last of me, say so at once. No, said Kokua, but this time she did not laugh, nor did Keawa ask for more. This was the wooing of Keawa. Things had gone swiftly, but so an arrow goes, and the ball of a rifle swifter still, and yet both may strike the target. Things had gone fast, but they had gone far also, and the thought of Kiawa rang in the maiden's head. She heard his voice in the breach of the surf upon the lava, and for this young man that she had seen but twice, she would have left father and mother and her native islands. As for Kiawa himself, his horse flew up the path of the mountain under the cliff tombs, and the sound of the hoofs and the echoing of Kiawa singing to himself for pleasure echoed in the caverns of the dead. 
He came to the bright house and still he was singing. He sat and ate in the broad balcony and the Chinaman wondered at his master to hear how he sang between the mouthfuls. The sun went down into the sea and the night came and Kiawa walked the balconies by lamplight high on the mountains and the voice of his singing startled men on ships. Here am I now upon my high place, he said to himself. Life may be no better. This is the mountaintop and all shelves about me toward the worst. For the first time I will light up the chambers and bathe in my fine bath with the hot water and the cold and sleep alone in the bed of my bridal chamber. So the Chinaman had word, and he must rise from his sleep and light the furnaces, and as he wrought below beside the boilers, he heard his master singing and rejoicing above him in the lighted chambers. When the water began to be hot, the Chinaman cried to his master, and Kiawa went into the bathroom, and the Chinaman heard him sing as he filled the marble basin and heard him sing, and the singing broken as he undressed, until all of a sudden the song ceased. The Chinaman listened and listened. He called up the house to Kiawa to ask if all were well, and Kiawa answered him yes and bade him go to bed. But there was no more singing in the bright house, and all night long the Chinaman heard his master's feet go round and round the balconies without repose. Now the truth of it was this, as Kiawa undressed for his bath, he spied upon his flesh a patch like a patch of lichen on a rock, and it was then that he stopped singing, for he knew the likeness of that patch, and knew that he was fallen in the Chinese evil. Now it is a sad thing for any man to fall into this sickness, and it would be a sad thing for anyone to leave a house so beautiful and so commodious and depart from all his friends to the north coast of Molokai, between the mighty cliff and the sea breakers. But what was that to the case of the man Kiawa, who had met his love but yesterday and won her but that morning, and now saw all his hopes break in a moment like a piece of glass? A while he sat upon the edge of the bath, and sprang with a cry and ran outside, and to and fro, to and fro, along the balcony like one despairing. Very willingly could I leave Hawaii, the home of my father's, Kiawa was thinking. Very lightly I could leave my home, the high place, the many windowed here upon the mountains. Very bravely could I go to Molokai, to Kalapapa by the cliffs, to live with the smitten and to sleep there, far from my father's. But what wrong have I done? What sin lies upon my soul that I should have encountered Kukua coming cool from the seawater in the evening? Kokua, the soul ensnarer, Kokua, the light of my life. Her may I never wed, her may I look upon no longer, her may I no more handle with my loving hands, and it is for this, it is for you, O Kokua, that I pour my lamentations. Now you are to observe what sort of man Kiawa was, for he might have dwelt there in the bright house for years, and no one been the wiser of his sickness. But he reckoned nothing of that if he must lose Kokua. And again he might have wed Kukua even as he was, and so many would have done, because they have the souls of pigs, but Keawa loved the maid manfully, and he would do her no hurt and bring her in no danger. A little beyond the midst of the night, there came in his mind the recollection of that bottle. He went round to the back porch and called to memory the day when the devil had looked forth, and at the thought ice ran in his veins. A dreadful thing is the bottle, thought Kiawa, and dreadful is the imp, and it is a dreadful thing to risk the flames of hell. But what other hope have I to cure my sickness or to wed Kukua? What, he thought, would I beard the devil once only to get me a house and not face him again to win Kukua? Thereupon he called to mind it was the next day the hall went by on her return to Honolulu. There must I go first, he thought, and see Lopaka, for the best hope that I have now is to find that same bottle I was so pleased to be rid of. Never a wink could he sleep, the food stuck in his throat, but he sent a letter to Keanu, and about the time when the steamer would be coming, rode down the cliffs of the tombs. It rained, his horse went heavily, he looked up at the black mouths of the caves, and he envied the dead that slept there, and were done with trouble, and called to mind how he had galloped by the day before, and was astonished. So he came down to Hukina, and there was all the country gathered for the steamer as usual. In the shed before the store they sat and jested and passed the news, but there was no matter of speech in Keawa's bosom, and he sat in their midst and looked without on the rain falling on the houses and the surf beating among the rocks and the sighs arose in his throat. Keawa of the bright house is out of spirits, said one to another. Indeed, and so he was, and little wonder. Then the hall came, and the whaleboat carried him on board. 
The after part of the ship was full of haoles who had been to visit the volcano as their custom is, and the midst was crowded with kanakas, and the fore part with wild bulls from Hilo, and horses from Kao. But Kiawa sat apart from all in his sorrow and watched for the house of Kiano. There it sat, low upon the shore in the black rocks and shaded by the cocoa palms, and there by the door was a red holoku, no greater than a fly, and going to and fro with the fly's busyness. Ah, queen of my heart, he cried, I'll venture my dear soul to win you. Soon after, darkness fell and the cabins were lit up, and the haoli sat and played at the cards and drank whiskey as their custom is, but Kiawa walked the deck all night, and all the next day as they steamed under the lee of Maui or Molokai, he was still pacing to and fro like a wild animal in a menagerie. Towards evening they passed Diamond Head and came to the pier of Honolulu. Keawa stepped out among the crowd and began to ask for Lopaka, but it seemed he had become the owner of a schooner, none better in the islands, and was gone upon an adventure as far as Polo Polo or Kahiki, so there was no help to be looked for from Lopaka. Keawa called to mind a friend of his, a lawyer in the town, I must not tell his name, and inquired of him. They said he was grown suddenly rich and had a fine new house upon Waikiki shore, and this put a thought in Keawa's head, and he called a hack and drove to the lawyer's house. The house was all brand new, and the trees in the garden no greater than walking sticks, and the lawyer, when he came, had the air of a man well pleased. "'What can I do to serve you?' said the lawyer. "'You are a friend of Lopaka's,' replied Kiawa, "'and Lopaka purchased from me a certain piece of goods that I thought you might enable me to trace.' The lawyer's face became very dark. "'I do not profess to misunderstand you, Mr. Kiawa," said he, "'though this is an ugly business to be stirring in. "'You may be sure I know nothing, but yet I have a guess, "'and if you would apply in a certain quarter, I think you might have news.' And he named the name of a man, which again I had better not repeat. So it was for days, and Kiawa went from one to another, finding everywhere new clothes and carriages, and fine new houses, and men everywhere in great contentment, although to be sure when he hinted at his business their faces would cloud over. No doubt I'm upon the track, thought Kiawa. These new clothes and carriages are all the gifts of the little imp, and these glad faces are the faces of men who have taken their profit and got rid of the accursed thing in safety. When I see pale cheeks and hear sighing, I shall know that I am near the bottle. So it befell at last that he was recommended to a haoli in Baritania Street. When he came to the door about the hour of the evening meal, there were the usual marks of the new house and the young garden and the electric light shining in the windows. But when the owner came, a shock of hope and fear ran through Kiawa, for here was a young man, white as a corpse and black about the eyes, the hair shedding from his head, and such a look in his countenance as a man may have when he is waiting for the gallows. Here it is, to be sure, thought Kiawa, and so with this man he no ways veiled his errand. I'm come to buy the bottle, said he. At the word, the young Haoli of Baritania Street reeled against the wall. The bottle, he gasped, to buy the bottle. Then he seemed to choke, and seizing Kiawa by the arm, carried him into a room and poured out wine in two glasses. Here's my respect, said Kiawa, who had been much about with Haolis in his time. Yes, he added, I have come to buy the bottle. What is the price by now? At that word, the young man let his glass slip through his fingers and looked upon Kiawa like a ghost. The price, says he, the price? You do not know the price? It is for that I am asking you, returned Kiawa. But why are you so much concerned? Is there anything wrong about the price? It has dropped a great deal in value since your time, Mr. Kiawa, said the young man, stammering. Well, well, I shall have the less to pay for it, said Kiawa. How much did it cost you? The young man was as white as a sheet. Two cents, said he. What? cried Kiawa. Two cents? Why, then, you can only sell it for one, and he who buys it... The words died upon Kiawa's tongue. He who bought it could never sell it again. The bottle and the bottle imp must abide with him until he died, and when he died must carry him to the red end of hell. The young man of Baritania Street fell upon his knees. For God's sake, buy it, he cried. You can have all my fortune in the bargain. I was mad when I bought it at that price. I had embezzled money at my store. I was lost, else. I must have gone to jail. Poor creature, said Kiawa. You would risk your soul upon so desperate an adventure and to avoid proper punishment of your own disgrace, and you think I could hesitate with love in front of me? Give me the bottle and the change which I make sure you have already. Here's a five-cent piece. 
It was as Kiawa supposed. The young man had the change ready in a drawer. The bottle changed hands, and Kiawa's fingers were no sooner clasped upon the stalk than he breathed his wish to be a clean man, and sure enough, when he got to his room and stripped himself before a glass, his flesh was whole like an infant's. And here was the strange thing. He had no sooner seen this miracle than his mind was changed within him, and he cared not for the Chinese evil and little enough for Kukua, and had but the one thought, that here he was bound to the bottle limp for time and for eternity, and had no better hope but to be a cinder forever in the flames of hell. Away ahead of him he saw them blaze with his mind's eye, and his soul shrank, and darkness fell upon the light. When Kiawa came to himself a little, he was aware it was the night when the band played at the hotel. Thither he went, because he feared to be alone, and there among happy faces walked to and fro, and heard the tunes go up and down, and saw Berger beat the measure, and all the while he heard the flames crackle, and saw the red fire burning in the bottomless pit. Of a sudden the band played Hiki Ao Ao, and that was a song that he had sung with Kokua, and at the strain courage returned to him. It is done now, he thought, and once more let me take the good along with the evil. So it befell that he returned to Hawaii by the first steamer, and as soon as it could be managed he was wedded to Kakua and carried her up the mountainside to the bright house. Now it was so with these two, that when they were together Keawa's heart was stilled, but so soon as he was alone he fell into a brooding horror, and heard the flames crackle, and saw the red fire burn in the bottomless pit. The girl indeed had come to him wholly. Her heart leapt in her side at sight of him. Her hand clung to his, and she was so fashioned from the hair upon her head to the nails upon her toes that none could see her without joy. She was pleasant in her nature. She had the good word always. Full of songs she was, and went to and fro in the bright house, the brightest thing in its three stories, caroling like the birds. And Kiawa beheld and heard her with delight, and then must shrink upon one side, and weep and groan to think upon the price that he had paid for her. And then he must dry his eyes and wash his face, and go and sit with her on the broad balconies, joining in her songs, and with a sick spirit answering her smiles. There came a day when her feet began to be heavy and her songs more rare, and now it was not Keawa only who would weep apart, but each would sunder from the other and sit in opposite balconies with the whole width of the bright house betwixt. Keawa was so sunk in his despair he scarce observed the change and was only glad he had more hours to sit alone and brood upon his destiny, and was not so frequently condemned to pull a smiling face on a sick heart. But one day, coming softly through the house, he heard the sound of a child sobbing, and there was Kukua rolling her face upon the balcony floor and weeping like the lost. You do well to weep in this house, Kukua, he said, and yet I would give the head off my body that you at least might have been happy. Happy, she cried. Kiawa, when you lived alone in your bright house, you were the word of the island for a happy man. Laughter and song were in your mouth, and your face was as bright as the sunrise. Then you wedded poor Kukua, and the good God knows what is amiss in her, but from that day you have not smiled. Oh, she cried, what ails me? I thought I was pretty, and I knew I loved him. What ails me that I throw this cloud upon my husband? Poor Kukua, said Kiawa. He sat down by her side and sought to take her hand. But that she plucked away. Poor Kukui, he said again. My poor child, my pretty, and I had thought all this while to spare you, while you shall know all. Then at least you will pity poor Kiawa. Then you will understand how much he loved you in the past, that he dared hell for your possession, and how much he loves you still, the poor condemned one, that he can yet call up a smile when he beholds you. With that he told her all, even from the beginning. You have done this for me, she cried. Ah, well, then what do I care? And she clasped and wept upon him. Ah, child, said Keawa, and yet when I consider of the fire of hell, I care a good deal. Never tell me, said she. No man can be lost because he loved Kukua and no other fault. I tell you, Keawa, I shall save you with these hands or perish in your company. What? You loved me and gave your soul and you think I could not die to save you in return? Ah, uh, my dear, he might die a hundred times, and what difference would that make, he cried, except to leave me lonely till the time comes of my damnation. You know nothing, said she. I was educated in a school in Honolulu. I am no common girl, and I tell you I shall save my lover. What is this you say about a cent? But all the world is not American. In England they have a piece they call a farthing, which is about half a cent. 
Oh, sorrow, she cried, that makes it scarcely better, for the buyer must be lost, and we shall find none so brave as my Keawe. But then there is France. They have a small claim there which they call a sane team, and these go five to the center thereabout. We could do no better. Come, Keawe, let us go to the French islands. Let us go to Tahiti as fast as ships can bear us. There we have four sin teams, three sin teams, two sin teams, one sin team, four possible sails to come and go on, and two of us to push the bargain. Come, my Keawe, kiss me and banish care. Kakua will defend you. Gift of God, he cried. I cannot think that God will punish me for desiring aught so good. Be it as you will, then. Take me where you please. I put my life and my salvation in your hands. Early the next day, Kakua was about her preparations. She took Keawe's chest that he went with sailoring, and first put the bottle in a corner, then packed it with the richest of their clothes and the bravest of the knickknacks in the house. For, said she, we must seem to be rich folks, or who will believe in the bottle? All the time of her preparation, she was as gay as a bird, only when she looked upon Keawe, the tears would spring in her eye, and she must run and kiss him. As for Keawe, a weight was off his soul. Now that he had his secret shared and some hope in front of him, he seemed like a new man. His feet went lightly on the earth, and his breath was good to him again. Yet was terror still at his elbow, and ever and again, as the wind blows out a taper, hope died in him, and he saw the flames toss and the red fire burn in hell. It was given out in the country they were gone pleasuring to the states, which was thought a strange thing, and yet not so strange as the truth, if any could have guessed it. So they went to Honolulu in the hall, and thence in the Umatilla to San Francisco with the crowd of Haoles, and at San Francisco took their passage by the male brigantine, the tropic bird, for Papeete, the chief place of the French in the South Islands. Thither they came after a pleasant voyage on a fair day of the trade wind, and saw the reef with the surf breaking, and Motuuti with its palms, and the schooner riding with inside and the white houses of the town low down upon the shore among the green trees, and overhead the mountains and the clouds of Tahiti, the wise island. It was judged the most wise to hire a house, which they did, accordingly, opposite the British consuls, to make a great parade of money, and themselves conspicuous with carriages and horses. This it was very easy to do, so long as they had the bottle in their possession, for Kakua was more bold than Keawe, and whenever she had a mine, called on the imp for twenty or a hundred dollars. At this rate they soon grew to be remarked in the town, and the strangers from Hawaii, their riding and their driving, the fine holokus and the rich lace of Kukua became a matter of much talk. They got on well after the first with the Tahitian language, which is indeed like to the Hawaiian with the change of certain letters, and as soon as they had any freedom of speech began to push the bottle. You are to consider it was not an easy subject to introduce. It was not easy to persuade people you were in earnest when you offered to sell them for four sane teams the spring of health and riches inexhaustible. It was necessary besides to explain the dangers of the bottle, and either people disbelieved the whole thing and laughed, or they thought the more of the darker part became overcast with gravity and drew away from Keawa and Kokua as from persons who had dealings with the devil. So far from gaining ground, these two began to find they were avoided in the town. The children ran away from them screaming, a thing intolerable to Kakua. Catholics crossed themselves as they went by, and all persons began with one accord to disengage themselves from their advances. Depression fell upon their spirits. They would sit at night in their new house, after a day's weariness, and not exchange one word, or the silence would be broken by Kokua bursting suddenly into sobs. Sometimes they would pray together. Sometimes they would have the bottle out upon the floor and sit all evening watching how the shadow hovered in the midst. At such times they would be afraid to go to rest. It was long ere slumber came to them, and if either dozed off it would be to wake and find the other silently weeping in the dark, or perhaps to wake alone, the other having fled from the house and the neighborhood of that bottle, to pace under the bananas in the little garden, or to wander on the beach by moonlight. One night it was so when Kokua awoke. Keawe was gone. She felt in the bed and his place was cold. Then fear fell upon her, and she sat up in bed. A little moonshine filtered through the shutters. The room was bright, and she could spy the bottle on the floor. Outside it blew high. The great trees of the avenue cried aloud, and the fallen leaves rattled in the veranda. 
In the midst of this, Kokua was aware of another sound, whether of a beast or of a man she could scarce tell, but it was as sad as death and cut her to the soul. Softly she arose, set the door ajar, and looked forth into the moonlit yard. There under the bananas lay Keawa, his mouth in the dust, and as he lay he moaned. It was Kokua's first thought to run forward and console him. Her second potently withheld her. Keawa had borne himself before his wife like a brave man. It became her little in the hour of weakness to intrude upon his shame. With the thought, she drew back into the house. Heaven, she thought, how careless have I been, how weak. It is he, not I, that stands in this eternal peril. It was he, not I, that took the curse upon his soul. It is for my sake, and for the love of a creature of so little worth and such poor help, that he now beholds so close to him the flames of hell, ay, and smells the smoke of it lying without there in the wind and the moonlight. Am I so dull of spirit that never till now I have surmised my duty, or have I seen it before and turned aside? But now at least I take up my soul in both the hands of my affection. Now I say farewell to the white steps of heaven and the waiting faces of my friends. A love for a love, and let mine be equaled with Keawas. A soul for a soul, and be it mine to perish. She was a deft woman with her hands, and was soon apparelled. She took in her hands the change, the precious same times they kept ever at their side, for this coin is little used, and they had made provision at a government office. When she was forth in the avenue, clouds came on the wind, and the moon was blackened. The town slept, and she knew not whither to turn till she heard one coughing in the shadow of the trees. Old man, said Kokua, what do you hear abroad in the cold night? The old man could scarce express himself for coughing, but she made out that he was old and poor and a stranger in the island. Will you do me a service, said Kukua, as one stranger to another, and as an old man to a young woman? Will you help a daughter of Hawaii? Ah, said the old man, so you are the witch from the eight islands, and even my old soul you seek to entangle. But I have heard of you, and defy your wickedness. Sit down here, said Kukua, and let me tell you a tale. And she told him the story of Kiawa from the beginning to the end. And now, said she, I am his wife, whom he bought with his soul's welfare, and what should I do? If I went to him myself and offered to buy it, he would refuse, but if you go, he will sell it eagerly. I will await you here. You will buy it for four centimes, and I will buy it again for three, and the Lord strengthen a poor girl. If you meant falsely, said the old man, I think God would strike you dead. He would, cried Kokua. Be sure he would. I could not be so treacherous. God would not suffer it. Give me the four same teams and await me here, said the old man. Now when Kokua stood alone in the street, her spirit died. The wind roared in the trees, and it seemed to her the rushing of the flames of hell. The shadows tossed in the light of the street lamp, and they seemed to her the snatching hands of evil ones. If she had had the strength, she must have run away, and if she had had the breath, she must have screamed aloud. But in truth, she could do neither, and stood and trembled in the avenue like an affrighted child. Then she saw the old man returning, and he had the bottle in his hand. I have done your bidding, said he. I left your husband weeping like a child. Tonight he will sleep easy, and he held the bottle forth. Before you give it me, Kokua panted, take the good with the evil, ask to be delivered from your cough. I am an old man, replied the other, and too near the gate of the grave to take a favor from the devil. What is this? Why do you not take the bottle? Do you hesitate? Not hesitate, cried Kukua. I am only weak. Give me a moment. It is my hand resists. My flesh shrinks back from the accursed thing. One moment only. The old man looked upon Kukua kindly. Poor child, said he. You fear. Your soul misgives you. Well, let me keep it. I am old, and can never more be happy in this world. And as for the next... Give it me, gasped Kukua. There is your money. Do you think I am so base as that? Give me the bottle. God bless you, child, said the old man. Kukua concealed the bottle under her holoku, said farewell to the old man, and walked off along the avenue she cared not whither, for all roads were now the same to her and led equally to hell. Sometimes she walked and sometimes ran. Sometimes she screamed out loud in the night and sometimes lay by the wayside in the dust and wept. 
All that she had heard of hell came back to her. She saw the flames blaze and she smelt the smoke and her flesh withered on the coals. Near day she came to her mind again and returned to the house. It was even as the old man said. Keawa slumbered like a child. Kukua stood and gazed upon his face. Now, my husband, said she, it is your turn to sleep. When you wake, it will be your turn to sing and laugh. But for poor Kukua, alas, that meant no evil. For poor Kukua, no more sleep, no more singing, no more delight, whether in earth or heaven. With that, she lay down in the bed by his side, and her misery was so extreme that she fell in a deep slumber instantly. Late in the morning, her husband woke her and gave her the good news. It seemed he was silly with delight, for he paid no heed to her distress, ill though she dissembled it. The words stuck in her mouth, it mattered not. Keawa did the speaking. She ate not a bite, but who was to observe it, for Keawa cleared the dish. Kakua saw and heard him like some strange thing in a dream. There were times when she forgot or doubted, and put her hands to her brow. To know herself doomed and hear her husband babble seemed so monstrous. All the while Kiao was eating and talking and planning the time of their return and thanking her for saving him and fondling her and calling her the true helper after all, he laughed at the old man that was fool enough to buy the bottle. A worthy old man he seemed, Kiawa said, but no one can judge by appearances, for why did the old reprobate require the bottle? My husband, said Kukua humbly, his purpose may have been good. Kiawa laughed like an angry man. Fiddle-dee-dee, said Kiawa, an old rogue, I tell you, and an old ass to boot, for the bottle is hard enough to sell at four sane teams, and at three it will be quite impossible. The margin is not broad enough. The thing begins to smell of scorching. Brrr, said he, and shuddered. It is true I bought it myself at a cent when I knew not there were smaller coins. I was a fool for my pains. There will never be found another, and whoever has that bottle now will carry it to the pit. Oh, my husband, said Kokua, is it not a terrible thing to save oneself by the eternal ruin of another? It seems to me I could not laugh. I would be humbled. I would be filled with melancholy. I would pray for the poor holder. Then Keawa, because he felt the truth of what she said, grew the more angry. Hey, Tady cried he, you may be filled with melancholy if you please. It is not the mind of a good wife. If you thought at all of me, you would sit ashamed. Thereupon he went out, and Kukua was alone. What chance had she to sell that bottle at two centimes? None, she perceived. And if she had any, here was her husband hurrying her away to a country where there was nothing lower than a scent. And here, on the morrow of her sacrifice, was her husband leaving her and blaming her. She would not even try to profit by what time she had, but sat in the house and now had the bottle out and viewed it with unutterable fear, and now with loathing hid it out of sight. By and by, Keawa came back and would have her take a drive. My husband, I am ill, she said. I am out of heart. Excuse me, I can take no pleasure. Then was Keawa more wroth than ever. With her, because he thought she was brooding over the case of the old man, and with himself, because he thought she was right and was ashamed to be so happy. This is your truth, cried he, and this your affection. Your husband is just saved from eternal ruin, which he encountered for the love of you, and you can take no pleasure. Kokua, you have a disloyal heart. He went forth again furious and wandered in the town all day. He met friends and drank with them. They hired a carriage and drove into the country and there drank again. All the time Keawa was ill at ease because he was taking this pastime while his wife was sad, and because he knew in his heart that she was more right than he, and the knowledge made him drink the deeper. Now there was an old brute of Haoli drinking with him, one that had been a boatswain on a whaler, a runaway, a digger in gold mines, a convict in prisons. He had a low mind and a foul mouth. He loved to drink and to see others drunken, and he pressed the glass upon Kiawa. Soon there was no more money in the company. Here you, says the boatswain, you are rich, you have always been saying, you have a bottle or some foolishness. Yes, says Kiawa, I am rich. I will go back and get some money for my wife who keeps it. That's a bad idea, mate, said the boatswain. Never you trust a petticoat with dollars. 
They're all as false as water. You keep an eye on her. Now this word stuck in Keawa's mind, for he was muddled with what he had been drinking. I should not wonder but what she was false indeed, thought he. Why else should she be so cast down at my release? But I will show her I am not the man to be fooled. I will catch her in the act. Accordingly, when they were back in town, Keawa bade the boatswain wait for him at the corner by the old calaboose, and went forward up the avenue alone to the door of his house. The night had come again, there was a light within, but never a sound, and Kiawa crept about the corner, opened the back door softly, and looked in. There was Kokua on the floor, the lamp at her side. Before her was a milk-white bottle with a round belly and a long neck, and as she viewed it, Kokua wrung her hands. A long time Kiawa stood and looked in the doorway. At first he was struck stupid, and then fear fell upon him that the bargain had been made amiss and that the bottle had come back to him as it came at San Francisco, and at that his knees were loosened, the fumes of the wine departed from his head like mists off a river in the morning. And then he had another thought, and it was a strange one that made his cheeks to burn. I must make sure of this, thought he. So he closed the door and went softly round the corner again, and then came noisily in as though he were but now returned, and lo, by the time he opened the front door, no bottle was to be seen, and Kokua sat in a chair and started up like one awakened out of sleep. I have been drinking all day and making merry, said Keawa. I have been with good companions, and now I only come back for money and return to drink and carouse with them again. Both his face and voice were as stern as judgment, but Kakua was too troubled to observe. You do well to use your own, my husband, said she, and her words trembled. Oh, I do well in all things, said Kiawa, and he went straight to the chest and took out money. But he looked besides in the corner where they kept the bottle, and there was no bottle there. At that the chest heaved upon the floor like a sea billow, and the house span around him like a wreath of smoke for he saw he was lost now, and there was no escape. It is what I feared, he thought. It is she who has bought it. And then he came to himself a little and rose up, but the sweat streamed on his face as thick as the rain and as cold as the well water. Kokua, said he, I said to you today what ill became me. Now I return to carouse with my jolly companions, and at that he laughed a little quietly. I will take more pleasure in the cup, if you forgive me. She clasped his knees in a moment. She kissed his knees with flowing tears. Oh, she cried, I asked but a kind word. Let us never one think hardly of the other, said Keawa, and was gone out of the house. Now the money that Keawa had taken was only some of that store of same team pieces they had laid in at their arrival. It was very sure he had no mind to be drinking. His wife had given her soul for him, now he must give his for hers. No other thought was in the world with him. At the corner by the old calaboose there was the boatswain waiting. My wife has the bottle, said Kiawa, and unless you help me to recover it, there can be no more money and no more liquor tonight. You do not mean to say you are serious about that bottle, cried the boatswain. There is the lamp, said Kiawa. Do I look as if I was jesting? That is so, said the boatswain. You look as serious as a ghost. Well then, said Keawa, here are two same teams. You must go to my wife in the house and offer her these for the bottle, which, if I am not much mistaken, she will give you instantly. Bring it to me here, and I will buy it back from you for one, for that is the law with this bottle, that it still must be sold for a less sum. But whatever you do, never breathe the word to her that you have come from me. Mate, I wonder, are you making a fool of me? asked the boatswain. It will do you no harm if I am, returned Keawa. That is so, mate, said the boatswain. And if you doubt me, asked Keawa, you can try. As soon as you are clear of the house, wish to have your pocket full of money, or a bottle of the best rum, or whatever you please, and you will see the virtue of the thing. Very well, Kanaka, said the boatswain. I will try, but if you are having your fun out of me, I will take my fun out of you with a belaying pin. So the whaler man went off up the avenue, and Keawa stood and waited. It was near the same spot where Kokua had waited the night before, but Keawa was more resolved and never faltered in his purpose. Only his soul was bitter with despair. It seemed a long time he had to wait before he heard a voice singing in the darkness of the avenue. 
He knew the voice to be the boatswain's, but it was strange how drunken it appeared upon a sudden. Next, the man himself came stumbling into the light of the lamp. He had the devil's bottle buttoned in his coat. Another bottle was in his hand, and even as he came in view, he raised it to his mouth and drank. You have it, said Kiawa. I see that. Hands off, cried the boatswain, jumping back. Take a step near me, and I'll smash your mouth. You thought you could make a cat's paw of me, did you? What do you mean? cried Kiawa. Mean, cried the boatswain. This is a pretty good bottle, this is. That's what I mean. How I got it for two same teams, I can't make out, but I'm sure you shan't have it for one. You mean you won't sell? gasped Kiawa. No, sir, cried the boatswain, but I'll give you a drink of the rum if you like. I tell you, said Kiawa, the man who has that bottle goes to hell. I reckon I'm going anyway, replied the sailor, and this bottle's the best thing to go with I've struck yet. No, sir, he cried again. This is my bottle now, and you can go and fish for another. Can this be true, Kiawa cried? For your own sake, I beseech you, sell it to me. I don't value any of your talk, replied the boatswain. You thought I was a flat. Now you see I'm not, and there's an end. If you won't have a swaddle of the rum, I'll have one myself. Here's your health, and good night to you. So off he went down the avenue towards town, and there goes the bottle out of the story. But Keawa ran to Kokua light as the wind, and great was their joy that night, and great since then has been the peace of all their days in the bright house. End of the Bottle Limp by Robert Louis Stevenson These Things by Edgar Poe, read in German. Dies ist eine LibriVox-Aufnahme. Alle LibriVox-Aufnahmen sind lizenzfrei und in öffentlichem Besitz. Für nähere Informationen zur Beteiligung an diesem Projekt besuchen Sie bitte LibriVox.org. Die Sphinx von Edgar Allan Poe, gelesen von Christoph Duder. Während der furchtbaren New Yorker Cholera-Zeit hatte ich es vorgezogen, die freundliche Einladung eines Verwandten anzunehmen und bei ihm in der Abgeschlossenheit eines Landhäuschens am Ufer des Hudson einige Wochen zuzubringen. Wir konnten uns dort all die üblichen Sommerunterhaltungen und Lustbarkeiten gestatten und hätten uns auch wohl die Zeit mit Ausflügen in die weiten Wälder mit Kahnfahren, Fischen, Baden, mit Malen und Zeichnen, mit Musik und Lektüre auf das Allerangenehmste vertrieben, wenn uns nicht jeden Morgen die schrecklichen Nachrichten aus der nahen Riesenstadt zugegangen wären. Beinahe kein Tag verstrich, der uns nicht die Nachricht vom Tode eines mehr oder weniger guten Bekannten brachte. Und als das Verhängnis weiter fortschritt, da sahen wir schließlich nur noch mit dem größten Bangen dem Boten entgegen, der uns die Briefe und Zeitungen brachte, denn wir konnten sicher sein. Unter den Opfern, die die Seuche seit der letzten Post gefordert, befand sich wieder einer unserer Freunde, wenn nicht gar mehrere und die Liebsten. So mochte es kommen, dass uns schließlich selbst die Luft, die aus dem Süden kam, todbringend schien. Mich wenigstens fasste dieser Gedanke, um mich schließlich nicht wieder loszulassen und sich in jede Wendung meines Sprechens, Denkens und Träumens einzuschleichen. Mein gastfreundlicher Verwandter war weniger erregt. Und obwohl er sich innerlich auch recht gedrückt fühlen mochte, versuchte er doch, mich aufzurichten. Sein scharfer, philosophisch geschulter Verstand ließ sich von Unwirklichkeiten nicht so leicht berühren. Tatsächliche Schrecknisse, Gefahren und so weiter konnten ihn sicherlich hart bedrängen, aber ihre bloßen Schatten gingen unwirksam an ihm vorüber. Seine Bemühungen, mich zusammenzurütteln und aus meinem Zustande krankhafter Verdüsterung, in den ich gesunken war, herauszureißen, wurden großteils durch gewisse Bücher vereitelt, die ich in seiner Bibliothek gefunden. Sie hatten einen Inhalt, der die Saat ererbten Aberglaubens in mir notwendig zum Keimen bringen musste. Ich hatte diese Bücher gelesen, ohne dass mein Gastgeber darum wusste, und so konnte er sich erst recht nicht erklären, welchem Umstände die dauernde Veränderung meines Wesens im Besonderen zuzuschreiben sein mochte, noch wissen, wie es überhaupt in mir aussah. Damals war ich ganz besonders geneigt, an Vorbedeutungen zu glauben. Ja, diesen Glauben selbst ernsthaft zu verteidigen. Wir führten darüber lange und lebhafte Debatten. Mein Verwandter betonte immer wieder, 
wie vollständig unberechtigt der Glaube an dergleichen Dinge sei. Ich behauptete dagegen, dass ein so vielfach empfundenes Gefühl, wenn es sich plötzlich unverbreitet ohne erkennbare Spuren einer Suggestion von außen einstellt, in sich selbst die nicht zu verkennende Kraft der Wahrheit enthalten und größere Beachtung beanspruchen müsse. Nun geschah es, dass sich bald nach meiner Ankunft in dem Landhause ein seltsamer Vorfall ereignete, der so viel Unheilverkündendes an sich hatte, dass es nur zu erklärlich war, wenn ich ihn als eine Vorbedeutung ansah. Er erschreckte, verwirrte und verstörte mich so, dass mehrere Tage vergingen, ehe ich mich entschließen konnte, meinem Freunde eine Mitteilung von demselben zu machen. Am Abend eines außerordentlich warmen Tages saß ich mit einem Buch in der Hand an einem offenen Fenster, das eine weite Aussicht längs der Ufer des Flusses auf einen entfernten Hügel gestattete, dessen mir zugekehrter Hang größtenteils der Bäume entblößt worden war. Meine Gedanken waren schon lange von dem Buch in meiner Hand zu den Verwüstungen gewandert, die in der benachbarten Stadt herrschen mochten. Als ich einmal meine Blicke von den Blättern erhob, fielen sie auf das nackte Bild jenes Hügels und auf einen Gegenstand, auf ein lebendiges Ungeheuer von schaudererregender Gestalt, das sich mit großer Schnelligkeit vom Gipfel zum Grunde bewegte und endlich in dem dichten Walde am Fuße des Hügels verschwand. Als mein Auge diese Wesen zuerst wahrnahm, bezweifelte ich meinen gesunden Verstand oder wenigstens das Zeugnis meiner Augen, und es dauerte einige Minuten lang, ehe ich mich davon überzeugte, dass ich weder irre sei noch träume. Und dennoch fürchte ich, dass alle, denen ich das Ungeheuer beschreibe, das ich noch deutlich sah und auf seinem ganzen Wege unausgesetzt beobachtete, noch schwerer zu überzeugen sein werden, als ich es selbst war. Ich schätzte die Größe des Umtieres durch einen Vergleich mit dem Durchmesser der großen Bäume ab, der wenigen Waldriesen, die man bei der Abholzung übergangen hatte, und schloss, dass sie beträchtlicher sei als die eines der mittelgroßen Dampfboote, die auf dem Flusse verkehrten. Ich sagte, als die eines Bootes, weil die Gestalt des Ungeheuers den Vergleich mit dem Rumpf eines solchen Fahrzeuges nahelegte. Der Mund des Tieres befand sich am Ende eines Rüssels, der sechzig oder siebzig Fuß lang und so dick wie der Körper eines gewöhnlichen Elefanten war. An der Wurzel des Rüssels wucherte eine ungeheure Menge schwarzen Haares, es war mehr als die Haut von zwanzig Büffeln hätte liefern können, und aus diesem Haare wuchsen seitlich nach unten zwei leuchtende Haue hervor, ähnlich wie bei dem wilden Eber, doch von unendlich größeren Dimensionen. Parallel mit dem Rüssel nach vorwärts gerichtet, befand sich auf jeder Seite von demselben etwas wie ein riesiger Stab, dreißig oder vierzig Fuß lang, anscheinend aus reinstem Kristall und von der Gestalt eines regelrechten Prismas, das die Strahlen der untergehenden Sonne auf das Prächtigste widerspiegelte. Der Rumpf hatte die Form eines Keils, dessen Spitze zur Erde gerichtet ist. Von ihm spreiteten sich zwei Paar Flügel aus, und zwar lag ein Paar über dem anderen. Jeder einzelne Flügel mochte ungefähr hundert Ellen lang sein und war reichlich mit Metallschuppen bedeckt, von denen jeder ungefähr zehn bis zwölf Fuß Durchmesser hatte. Ich bemerkte, dass das obere und untere Paar Flügel durch eine starke Kette miteinander in Verbindung standen. Das Sonderbarste an diesem schrecklichen Wesen war das Bild eines Totenkopfes, das fast die gesamte Oberfläche der Brust bedeckte und sich nun in strahlendstem Weiß so deutlich von dem übrigen Schwarz des Körpers abhob, als habe es ein Künstler sorgfältig aufgezeichnet. Während ich dies fürchterliche Tier und besonders das Bild auf seiner Brust mit Furcht und Entsetzen betrachtete, mit einer Vorempfindung kommenden Unheils, die ich durch keine Verstandesgründe niederzuringen vermochte, bemerkte ich, dass sich die ungeheuren Kiefer am Ende des Rüssels teilten und ein so lauter, eindringlicher Wehelaut aus ihnen hervordrang, dass er meine Nerven zerriss wie ein Totengeläute. Als das Ungeheuer am Fuße des Berges verschwand, sank ich ohnmächtig zu Boden. Ich kam jedoch bald wieder zu mir. Meine erste Empfindung war, meinem Wirte alles, was ich gesehen und gehört hatte, sofort mitzuteilen 
und es ist mir selbst kaum erklärlich, welches Gefühl des Widerwillens mich zum Schluss dennoch daran hinderte. Eines Abends, drei oder vier Tage nach dem Vorfall, saßen wir zusammen in dem Zimmer, von dem aus ich die Erscheinung beobachtet hatte. Ich hatte denselben Sitz an demselben Fenster inne. Er lag gemächlich auf dem Sofa an meiner Seite. Die Ähnlichkeit der Situation trieb mich ihm von dem Phänomen doch noch zu reden. Er hörte mich bis zu Ende an, lachte erst herzlich, wurde aber dann plötzlich außerordentlich ernst, als zweifle er an meinem gesunden Verstande. In diesem Augenblick jedoch erblickte ich das Ungeheuer wieder ganz deutlich und richtete mit einem Schrei des Entsetzens die Aufmerksamkeit meines Freundes auf dasselbe. Er blickte aufmerksam hin, behauptete jedoch nichts zu sehen, obwohl ich ihm bis ins Kleinste den Weg des Tieres auf dem nackten Abhänge des Hügels bezeichnete. Ich war nun über die Maßen erschreckt, denn ich hielt die Erscheinung entweder für eine Vorbedeutung meines Todes oder, was noch viel schlimmer war, für den Vorläufer eines Wahnsinnsanfalles. In höchster Erregung warf ich mich in einen Stuhl zurück und verbarg ein paar Augenblicke lang mein Gesicht in meinen Händen. Als ich wieder aufblickte, war die Erscheinung nicht mehr zu sehen. Mein Gastgeber jedoch hatte seine Ruhe so ziemlich wiedererlangt und fragte mich nun auf das Genaueste nach der Gestalt des geschauten Wesens. Als ich ihn vollständig befriedigt hatte, seufzte er auf, als sei er von einer schweren Last erlöst und begann mit einer wie mir schien grausamen Ruhe von verschiedenen Punkten der spekulativen Philosophie zu sprechen, über die wir schon oft diskutiert hatten. Ich erinnere mich, dass er sich unter anderem ganz besonders über den Gedanken verbreitete, dass die hauptsächlichste Quelle des Irrtums aller menschlichen Erforschungen in der Neigung des Verstandes begründet lege, die Größe eines Gegenstandes zu über- oder zu unterschätzen, und zwar durch falsche Taxierung seiner Nähe. »So müsste«, sagte er, »wenn man den Einfluss abschätzen wollte, den einst die gänzliche Ausbreitung der Demokratie auf die Menschheit haben wird, die Entfernung jenes Zeitpunktes, an dem eine solche Ausbreitung möglich sein würde, ein beachtenswertes Moment bei dieser Abschätzung bilden. Und doch, kannst du mir einen Sozialpolitiker nennen, der jemals diesem Punkt der Diskussion Wert erachtete? Hier unterbrach er, ging zum Bücherschrank und entnahm demselben einen der gewöhnlichen Leitfäden der Naturgeschichte. Dann bat er mich, den Platz mit ihm zu wechseln, damit er den kleinen Druck des Buches besser lesen könne, schob meinen Lehnstuhl ans Fenster und nahm seine Rede mit dem gleichen Tone wie vorher wieder auf. »Wenn du mir das Ungeheuer nicht so außerordentlich genau beschrieben hättest,« sagte er, »hätte ich dir niemals zeigen können, was es wirklich ist. Zuerst will ich dir vorlesen, was die Schulknaben von der Gattung Sphinx aus der Familie Crepuscularia aus der Ordnung Lepidoptera der Klasse der Insekten lernen müssen. Hier heißt es folgendermaßen. Vier häutige Flügel mit kleinen farbigen Schuppen von metallischem Aussehen bedeckt. Mund bildet einen Rüssel, hervorgebracht durch eine Verlängerung der Kiefern. Das untere Flügelpaar ist mit dem oberen durch ein steifes Haar verbunden. Antennae hat die Gestalt einer verlängerten Keule prismatisch. Unterleib läuft spitz zu. Die Totenkopf-Sphinx hat zu gewissen Zeiten durch die Klagetöne, die sie ausstößt, und durch die Zeichnung des Totenkopfes, die sie auf der Brust trägt, großen Schrecken unter dem Volke hervorgerufen. Hier schloss er das Buch und neigte sich in dem Stuhl ein wenig vor, bis er genau dieselbe Stellung einnahm, die ich in dem Augenblicke inne hatte, als ich das Ungeheuer erblickte. »Ah, da ist es!« rief er aus. Es steigt den Abhang des Hügels wieder hinauf, und ich muss gestehen, dass es wirklich ein höchst merkwürdig aussehendes Geschöpf ist. Doch ist es nicht in dem Entferntesten so groß oder so entfernt, wie du dachtest, denn in Wirklichkeit misst es, während es sich jetzt an dem Faden, den eine Spinne an den Fensterflügel gesponnen hat, hinaufwindet, von seinem äußersten Ende zum anderen ein Sechzehntel Zoll und ist ebenso ungefähr ein Sechzehntel Zoll von der Pupille meines Auges entfernt. Ende von Die Sphinx von Edgar Allan Poe Übersetzt von Hedwig Lachmann A Fight with a Cannon 
by Victor Hugo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Arrowit. A Fight with a Cannon by Victor Hugo. La Ville was suddenly cut short by a cry of despair, and at the same time a noise was heard wholly unlike any other sound. The cries and sounds came from within the vessel. The captain and lieutenant rushed toward the gun deck, but could not get down. All the gunners were pouring up in dismay. Something terrible had just happened. One of the carronades of the battery, a twenty-four pounder, had broken loose. This is the most dangerous accident that can possibly take place on shipboard. Nothing more terrible can happen to a sloop of was in open sea and under full sail. A cannon that breaks its moorings suddenly becomes some strange supernatural beast. It is a machine transformed into a monster. That short mass of wheels moves like a billiard ball, rolls with the rolling of the ship, plunges with the pitching, goes, comes, stops, seems to meditate, starts on its course again, shoots like an arrow from one end of the vessel to the other, whirls around, slips away, dodges, rears, bangs, crashes, kills, exterminates. It is a battering ram capriciously assaulting a wall. Add to this the fact that the ram is of metal, the wall of wood. It is matter set free. One might say, this eternal slave was avenging itself. It seems as if the total depravity concealed in what we call inanimate things has escaped and burst forth all of a sudden. It appears to lose patience, and to take a strange, mysterious revenge. Nothing more relentless than this wrath of the inanimate. This enraged lump leaps like a panther. It has the clumsiness of an elephant, the nimbleness of a mouse, the obstinacy of an ox, the uncertainty of the billows, the zigzag of the lightning, the deafness of the grave. It weighs ten thousand pounds, and it rebounds like a child's ball. It spins, and then abruptly darts off again at right angles. And what is to be done? How to put an end to it? A tempest ceases, a cyclone passes over, a wind dies down, a broken mass can be replaced, a leak can be stopped, a fire extinguished, but what will become of this enormous brute of bronze? How can it be captured? You can reason with a bulldog, astonish a bull, fascinate a bull, frighten a tiger, tame a lion, but you have no resource against this monster or loose cannon. You cannot kill it, it is dead, and at the same time it lives. It lives with a sinister life which comes to it from the infinite. The deck beneath it gives it full swing. It is moved by the ship, which is moved by the sea, which is moved by the wind. This destroyer is a toy. The ship, the waves, the winds, all play with it, hence its frightful animation. What is to be done with this apparatus? How to fetter this stupendous engine of destruction? How to anticipate its comings and goings, its returns, its stops, its shocks? Any one of the blows on the side of the ship may stave it in. How foretell its frightful meanderings? It is dealing with a projectile which alters its mind, which seems to have ideas, and changes its direction every instant. How to check the course of what must be avoided? The horrible cannon struggles, advances, backs, strikes right, strikes left, retreats, passes by, disconcerts expectation, grinds up obstacles, crushes men like flies. All the terror of the situation is in the fluctuations of the flooring. How fight an inclined plane subject to caprices? The ship has, so to speak, in its belly, an imprisoned thunderstorm, striving to escape, something like a thunderbolt rumbling above an earthquake. In an instant the whole crew was on foot. It was the fault of the gun captain, who had neglected to fasten the screw-nut of the mooring chain, and had insecurely clogged the four wheels of the gun carriage. This gave play to the sole and the framework, separated the two platforms and the breaching. The tackle had given way, so that the cannon was no longer firm on its carriage. The stationary breaching, which prevents recoil, was not in use at this time. A heavy sea struck the port. The carronade, insecurely fastened, had recoiled and broken its chain, and begun its terrible course over the deck. To form an idea of this strange sliding, let one imagine a drop of water running over a glass. At the moment when the fastenings gave way, the gunners were in the battery, some in groups, others scattered about, busied with the customary work among sailors, getting ready for a signal for action. The carronade, hurled forward by the pitching of the vessel, made a gap in this crowd of men, and crushed four at the first blow. Then, sliding back and shot out again as the ship rolled, it cut into a fifth unfortunate, and knocked a piece of the battery against the larboard side with such force as to unship it. This caused the cry of distress just heard. 
All the men rushed to the companionway. The gun deck was vacated in a twinkling. The enormous gun was left alone. It was given up to itself. It was its own master and master of the ship. It could do what it pleased. This whole crew, accustomed to laugh in the time of battle, now trembled. To describe the terror is impossible. Captain Voice Berthelot and Lieutenant La Vieuville, although both dauntless men, stopped at the head of the companionway and, dumb, pale, and hesitating, looked down on the deck below. Someone elbowed past and went down. It was their passenger, the peasant, the man of whom they had just been speaking a moment before. Reaching the foot of the companionway, he stopped. The cannon was rushing back and forth on the deck. One might have supposed it to be the living chariot of the apocalypse. The marine lantern swinging overhead added a dizzy shifting of light and shade to the picture. The form of the cannon disappeared in the violence of its course, and looked now black in the light, now mysteriously white in the darkness. It went on in its destructive work. It had already shattered four other guns, and made two gaps in the side of the ship, fortunately above the water line, but where the water would come in in case of heavy weather. It rushed frantically against the framework. The strong timbers withstood the shock. The curved shape of the wood gave them great power of resistance, but they creaked beneath the blows of this huge club, beating on all sides at once, with a strange sort of ubiquity. The percussions of a grain of shot shaken in a bottle are not swifter or more senseless. The four wheels passed back and forth over the dead men, cutting them, carving them, slashing them, till the five corpses were a score of stumps rolling around the deck. The heads of the dead men seemed to cry out. Streams of blood curled over the deck with the rolling of the vessel. The planks, damaged in several places, began to gape open. The whole ship was filled with the horrid noise and confusion. The captain promptly recovered his presence of mind, and ordered everything that could check and impede the cannon's mad course to be thrown through the hatchway down on the gun deck. Mattresses, hammocks, spare sails, rolls of cordage, bags belonging to the crew, and bales of counterfeit assignats, of which the corvette carried a large quantity, a characteristic piece of English villainy regarded as legitimate warfare. But what could these rags do? As nobody dared to go below to dispose of them properly, they were reduced to lint in a few minutes. There was just sea enough to make the accident as bad as possible. A tempest would have been desirable, for it might have upset the cannon, and with its four wheels once in the air there would be some hope of getting it under control. Meanwhile the havoc increased. There were splits and fractures in the mats, which are set into the framework of the keel, and rise above the decks of ships like great round pillars. The convulsive blows of the cannon had cracked the mizzen mast and had cut into the mainmast. The battery was being ruined. Ten pieces out of thirty were disabled, the breaches in the side of the vessel were increasing, and the corvette was beginning to leak. The old passenger, having gone down to the gun deck, stood like a man of stone at the foot of the steps. He cast a stern glance over this scene of devastation. He did not move. It seemed impossible to take a step forward. Every movement of the loose carronade threatened the ship's destruction. A few moments more and shipwreck would be inevitable. They must perish or put a speedy end to the disaster. Some course must be decided on, but what? What an opponent was this carronade? Something must be done to stop this terrible madness, to capture this lightning, to overthrow this thunderbolt. Voice Berthelot said to La Viville, Do you believe in God, Chevalier? La Viville replied, Yes, no, sometimes. During a tempest? Yes, and in moments like this? God alone can save us from this, said Voice Berthelot. Everybody was silent, letting the carronade continue its horrible din. Outside, the waves beating against the ship responded with their blows to the shocks of the cannon. It was like two hammers alternating. Suddenly, in the midst of this inaccessible ring, where the escaped cannon was leaping, a man was seen to appear, with an iron bar in his hand. He was the author of the catastrophe, the captain of the gun, guilty of criminal carelessness, and the cause of the accident, the master of the carronade. Having done the mischief, he was anxious to repair it. He had seized the iron bar in one hand, a tiller rope was a slip noose in the other, and jumped down the hatchway to the gun deck. Then began an awful sight, a titanic scene, the contest between gun and gunner, the battle of matter and intelligence, the duel between man and the inanimate. The man stationed himself in a corner, and, with bar and rope in his two hands, braced himself on his legs, which seemed two steel posts, and livid, calm, tragic, as if rooted to the deck, he waited. He waited for the cannon to pass by him. The gunner knew his gun, and it seemed to him as if the gun ought to know him. He had lived long with it. How many times had he thrust his hand into its mouth? It was his own familiar monster. He began to speak to it, as if it were his dog. 
Come, he said. Perhaps he loved it. He seemed to wish it to come to him. But to come to him was to come upon him, and then he would be lost. How could he avoid being crushed? That was the question. All looked on in terror. Not a breast breathed freely, unless perhaps that of the old man, who was alone in the battery with the two contestants, a stern witness. He might be crushed himself by the cannon. He did not stir. Beneath them the sea blindly directed the contest. At the moment when the gunner, accepting this frightful hand-to-hand -hand conflict, challenged the cannon, some chance rocking of the sea caused the carronade to remain for an instant motionless and as if stupefied. "'Come, now!' said the man. It seemed to listen. Suddenly it leaped toward him. The man dodged the blow. The battle began. Battle unprecedented. Frailty struggling against the invulnerable. The gladiator of flesh attacking the beast of brass. On one side brute force, on the other a human soul. All this was taking place in semi-darkness. It was like the shadowy vision of a miracle. A soul. Strange to say, one would have thought the cannon also had a soul, but a soul full of hatred and rage. This sightless thing seemed to have eyes. The monster appeared to lie in wait for the man. One would have at least believed that there was craft in this mass. It also chose its time. It was a strange, gigantic insect of metal, having or seeming to have the will of a demon. For a moment this colossal locust would beat against the low ceiling overhead, then it would come down on its four wheels like a tiger on its four paws and begin to run at the man. He, supple, nimble, expert, writhed away like an adder from all these lightning movements. He avoided a collision, but the blows which he parried fell against the vessel and continued their work of destruction. An end of broken chain was left hanging to the carronade. This chain had in some strange way become twisted around the screw of the cascabel. One end of the chain was fastened to the gun carriage. The other, left loose, whirled desperately around the cannon, making all its blows more dangerous. The screw held it in a firm grip, adding a thong to the battering ram, making a terrible whirlwind around the cannon, an iron lash in a brazen hand. This chain complicated the contest. However, the men went on fighting. Occasionally it was the man who attacked the cannon. He would creep along the side of the vessel, bar and rope in hand, and the cannon, as if it understood, and as though suspecting some snare, would flee away. The man, bent on victory, pursued it. Such things cannot long continue. The cannon seemed to say to itself, all of a sudden, Come, now, make an end of it, and it stopped. One felt that the crisis was at hand. The cannon, as if in suspense, seemed to have, or really had, for to all that was a living being, a ferocious malice prepense. It made a sudden quick dash at the gunner. The gunner sprang out of the way, let it pass by, and cried out to it with a laugh. Try it again! The cannon, as if enraged, smashed a carronade on the port side. Then, again seized by the invisible sling which controlled it, it was hurled to the starboard side of the man, who made his escape. Three carronades gave way under the blows of the cannon. Then, as if blind and not knowing what more to do, it turned its back on the man, rolled from stern to bow, injured the stern, and made a breach in the planking of the prow. The man took refuge at the foot of the steps, not far from the old man who was looking on. The gunner held his iron bar in rest. The cannon seemed to notice it, and without taking the trouble to turn around, slid back on the man, swift as the blow of an axe. The man, driven against the side of the ship, was lost. The whole crew cried out in terror. But the old passenger, till this moment motionless, darted forth more quickly than any of this wildly swift rapidity. He seized a package of counterfeit assignants, and, at the risk of being crushed, succeeded in throwing it between the wheels of the carronade. This decisive and perilous movement could not have been made with more exactness and precision by a man trained in all the exercises described in Duracell's Manual of Gun Practice at Sea. The package had the effect of a clog. A pebble may stop a log, the branch of a tree turn aside an avalanche. The carronade stumbled. The gunner, taking advantage of this critical opportunity, plunged his iron bar between the spokes of one of the hind wheels. The cannon stopped. It leaned forward. The man, using the bar as a lever, held it in equilibrium. The heavy mass was overthrown with the crash of a falling bell, and the man, running with all his might, dripping with perspiration, passed the slip noose around the bronze neck of the subdued monster. It was ended. The man had conquered. The ant had control over the mastodon. The pygmy had taken the thunderbolt prisoner. The marines and sailors clapped their hands. The whole crew rushed forward with cables and chains, and in an instant the cannon was secured. The gunner saluted the passenger. 
Sir, he said, you have saved my life. The old man had resumed his impassive attitude, and made no reply. The man had conquered, but the cannon might be said to have conquered as well. Immediate shipwreck had been avoided, but the corvette was not saved. The damage to the vessel seemed beyond repair. There were five breaches in her sides, one very large in the bow. Twenty of the thirty carronades lay useless in their frames. The one which had just been captured and chained again was disabled. The screw of the cascabel was sprung, and consequently leveling the gun made impossible. The battery was reduced to nine pieces. The ship was leaking. It was necessary to repair the damages at once, and to work the pumps. The gun deck, now that one could look over it, was frightful to behold. The inside of an infuriated elephant's cage would not be more completely demolished. However great might be the necessity of escaping observation, the necessity of immediate safety was still more imperative to the corvette. They had been obliged to light up the deck with lanterns hung here and there on the sides. However, all the while this tragic play was going on, the crew were absorbed by a question of life and death, and they were wholly ignorant of what was taking place outside the vessel. The fog had grown thicker, the weather had changed, the wind had worked its pleasure with the ship. They were out of their course, with Jersey and Guernsey close at hand, further to the south than they ought to have been, and in the midst of a heavy sea. Great billows kissed the gaping winds of the vessel, kisses full of danger. The rocking of the sea threatened destruction. The breeze had become a gale, a squall, a tempest perhaps, was brewing. It was impossible to see four waves ahead. While the crew were hastily repairing the damages to the gun deck, stopping the leaks, and putting in place the guns which had been uninjured in the disaster, the old passenger had gone on deck again. He stood with his back against the mainmast. He had not noticed a proceeding which had taken place on the vessel. The Chevalier de la Verville had drawn up the marines in line on both sides of the mainmast, and at the sound of the butt swing's whistle the sailors formed in line, standing on the yards. The Count de Bosberthelot approached the passenger. Behind the captain walked a man, haggard, out of breath, his dress disordered, but still with a look of satisfaction on his face. It was the gunner who had just shown himself so skillful in subduing monsters, and who had gained the mastery over the cannon. The Count gave the military salute to the old man in peasant's dress, and said to him, General, there is the man. The gunner remained standing, with downcast eyes, in military attitude. The Count de Bosberthelot continued, General, in consideration of what this man has done, do you not think there is something due him from his commander? I think so, said the old man. Please give your orders, replied Bosberthelot. It is for you to give them. You are the captain. But you are the general, replied Bosberthelot. The old man looked at the gunner. Come forward, he said. The gunner approached. The old man turned toward the Count of Bosberthelot, took off the cross of St. Louis on the captain's coat, and fastened it on the gunner's jacket. Hurrah! cried the sailors. The marines presented arms. And the old passenger, pointing to the dazzled gunner, added, Now have this man shot. Dismay succeeded the cheering. Then, in the midst of the death-like stillness, the old man raised his voice and said, Carelessness has compromised this vessel. At this very hour it is perhaps lost. To be at sea is to be in front of the enemy. A ship making a voyage is an army waging war. The tempest is concealed, but it is at hand. The whole sea is an ambuscade. Death is the penalty of any misdemeanor committed in the face of the enemy. No fault is reparable. Courage should be rewarded and negligent punished. These words fell one after another, solely, solemnly, in a sort of inexorable meter, like the blows of an axe upon an oak. And the man, looking at the soldiers, added, Let it be done. The man on whose jacket hung the shining cross of St. Louis bowed his head. At a signal from Count de Bosberthelot, two sailors went below and came back, bringing the hammock shroud. The chaplain, who since they sailed had been at prayer in the officers' quarters, accompanied the two sailors. A sergeant detached twelve marines from the line and arranged them in two files, six by six. The gunner, without uttering a word, placed himself between the two files. The chaplain, crucifix in hand, advanced and stood beside him. March, said the sergeant. The platoon marched with slow steps toward the bow of the vessel. The two sailors, carrying the shroud, followed. A gloomy silence fell over the vessel. A hurricane howled in the distance. A few moments later, a light flashed, a report sounded through the darkness. Then all was still, and the sound of a body falling into the sea was heard. The old passenger, still leaning against the mainmast, 
he crossed his arms, and was buried in thought. Boisberthelot pointed to him with the forefinger of his left hand, and said to La Viville in a low voice, La Vendée has a head. End of A Fight with a Cannon by Victor Hugo The Hurrying of Ludovic from Chronicles of Avonlea This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Clarica Chronicles of Avonlea by L. M. Montgomery The Hurrying of Ludovic Anne Shirley was curled up on the window seat of Theodora Dix's sitting room, one Saturday evening, looking dreamily afar at some fair starland beyond the hills of sunset. Anne was visiting for a fortnight of her vacation at Echo Lodge, where Mr. and Mrs. Stephen Irving were spending the summer, and she often ran over to the old Dix homestead to chat for a while with Theodora. They had had their chat out on this particular evening, and Anne was giving herself over to the delight of building an air castle. She leaned her shapely head with its braided coronet of dark red hair against the window casing, and her gray eyes were like the moonlit gleam of shadowy pools. Then she saw Ludovic Speed coming down the lane. He was yet far from the house, for the Dick's Lane was a long one, but Ludovic could be recognized as far as he could be seen. No one else in Middle Grafton had such a tall, gently stooping, placidly moving figure. In every kink and turn of it there was an individuality, all Ludovic's own. Anne roused herself from her dreams, thinking it would only be tactful to take her to departure. Ludovic was courting Theodora. Everyone in Grafton knew that, or, if anyone were in ignorance of the fact, it was not because he had not had time to find out. Ludovic had been coming down that lane to see Theodora, in the same ruminating, unhastening fashion, for fifteen years. When Anne, who was slim and girlish and romantic, rose to go, Theodora, who was plump and middle-aged and practical, said, with a twinkle in her eye, "'There isn't any hurry, child. Sit down and have your call out. You've seen Ludovic coming down the lane, and, I suppose, you think that you'll be a crowd, but you won't.' Ludovic rather likes a third person around, and so do I. It spurs up the conversation, as it were. When a man has been coming to see you straight along twice a week for fifteen years, you get rather talked out by spells. Theodora never pretended to bashfulness where Ludovic was concerned. She was not at all shy of referring to him in his dilatory courtship. Indeed, it seemed to amuse her. Anne sat down again, and together they watched Ludovic coming down the lane, gazing calmly about him at the lush clover fields and the blue loops of the river winding in and out of the misty valley below. Anne looked at Theodora's placid, finely molded face, and tried to imagine what she herself would feel like if she were sitting there, waiting for an elderly lover who had, seemingly, taken so long to make up his mind. But even Anne's imagined nation failed her for this. Anyway, she thought impatiently, if I wanted him, I think I'd find some way of hurrying him up. Ludovic Speed! Was there ever such a misfit of a name? Such a name for such a man is a delusion and a snare. Presently Ludovic got to the house, but stood so long on the doorstep in a brown study, gazing into the tangled green boskage of the cherry orchard, that Theodora finally went and opened the door before he knocked. As she brought him into the sitting-room, she made a comical grimace at Anne over his shoulder. Ludovic smiled pleasantly at Anne. He liked her. She was the only girl he knew, for he generally avoided young girls. They made him feel awkward and out of place. But Anne did not affect him in this fashion. She had a way of getting on with all sorts of people, and, although they had not known her very long, both Ludovic and Theodora looked upon her as an old friend. Ludovic was tall and somewhat ungainly, but his unhesitating placidity gave him the appearance of a dignity that did not otherwise pertain to him. He had a drooping, silky, brown moustache, and a little curly tuft of imperial, a fashion which was regarded as eccentric in Grafton, where men had clean-shaven chins or went full-bearded. His eyes were dreamy and pleasant, with a touch of melancholy in their blue depths. He sat down in the big, bulgy old armchair that had belonged to Theodora's father, 
Ludovic always sat there, and Anne declared that the chair had come to look like him. The conversation soon grew animated enough. Ludovic was a good talker when he had somebody to draw him out. He was well read, and frequently surprised Anne by his shrewd comments on men and matters out in the world, of which only the faint echoes reached Deland River. He had also a fair liking for religious arguments with Theodora, who did not care much for politics or the making of history, but was avid of doctrines and read everything pertaining thereto. When the conversation drifted into an eddy of friendly wrangling between Ludovic and Theodora over Christian science, Anne understood that her usefulness was ended for the time being, and that she would not be missed. "'It's star-time and good-night time,' she said, and went away quietly. But she had to stop to laugh when she was well out of sight of the house, in a green meadow bestarred with the white and gold of daisies. A wind, odor freighted, blew daintily across it. Anne leaned against a white birch tree in the corner and laughed heartily, as she was apt to do whenever she thought of Ludovic and Theodora. To her eager youth this courtship of theirs seemed a very amusing thing. She liked Ludovic, but allowed herself to be provoked with him. "'The dear, big, irritating goose,' she said aloud. "'There never was such a lovable idiot before. "'He's just like the alligator in the old rhyme, "'who wouldn't go along and wouldn't keep still, "'but just kept bobbing up and down.' Two evenings later, when Anne went over to the Dick's place, she and Theodora drifted into a conversation about Ludovic. Theodora, who was the most industrious soul alive, and had a mania for fancy work into the bargain, was busying her smooth, plump fingers with a very elaborate Battenberg lace centerpiece. Anne was lying back in a little rocker, with her slim hands folded in her lap, watching Theodora. She realized that Theodora was very handsome in a stately, Juno-like fashion of firm, white flesh, large, clearly chiseled outlines, and great, cowy brown eyes. When Theodora was not smiling, she looked very imposing. Anne thought it likely that Ludovic held her in awe. "'Did you and Ludovic talk about Christian science all Saturday evening?' she asked. Theodora overflowed into a smile. "'Yes, and we even quarreled over it. At least I did. Ludovic wouldn't quarrel with anyone. You have to fight fair when you spar with him. I hate to square up to a person who won't hit back.' "'Theodora,' said Anne coaxingly, "'I'm going to be curious and impertinent. You can snub me if you like. Why don't you and Ludovic get married?' Theodore laughed comfortably. "'That's the question Grafton folks have been asking for quite a while, I reckon, Anne. "'Well, I'd have no objection to marrying Ludovic. That's frank enough for you, isn't it? "'But it's not easy to marry a man unless he asks you. And Ludovic has never asked me.' "'Is he too shy?' persisted Anne. Since Theodora was in the mood, she meant to sift this puzzling affair to the bottom. Theodora dropped her work and looked meditatively out over the green slopes of the summer world. "'No, I don't think it is that. Ludovic isn't shy. It's just his way, the speed way. The speeds are all dreadfully deliberate. They spend years thinking over a thing before they make up their minds to do it. Sometimes they get so much in the habit of thinking about it that they never get over it. Like old Alder Speed, who was always talking of going to England to see his brother, but never went, though there was no earthly reason why he shouldn't. They're not lazy, you know, but they love to take their time.' "'And Ludovic is just an aggravated case of speedism,' suggested Anne. "'Exactly. He never hurried in his life. Why, he has been thinking for the last six years of getting his house painted. He talks it over with me every little while, and picks out the color, and there the matter stays. He's fond of me, and he means to ask me to have him some time. The only question is, will the time ever come?' "'Why don't you hurry him up?' asked Anne impatiently. Theodora went back to her stitches with another laugh. "'If Ludovic could be hurried up, I'm not the one to do it. I'm too shy. It sounds ridiculous to hear a woman of my age and inches to say that, but it is true. Of course I know it's the only way any speed ever did make out to get married. For instance, there's a cousin of mine married to Ludovic's brother. I don't say she proposed to him out and out, but, mind you, Anne, it wasn't far from it. I couldn't do anything like that. I did try once.' When I realized I was getting sere and mellow, and all the girls of my generation were going off on either hand, I tried to give Ludovic a hint, but it stuck in my throat, and now I don't mind. If I don't change Dick's to speed until I take the initiative, it will be Dick's to the end of life. 
Ludovic doesn't realize that we are growing old, you know. He thinks we are giddy young folks yet, with plenty of time before us. That's the speed failing. They never find out they're alive until they're dead. "'You're fond of Ludovic, aren't you?' asked Anne, detecting a note of real bitterness among Theodora's paradoxes. "'Laws, yes,' Theodora said candidly. She did not think it worth while to blush over so settled a fact. "'I think the world and all of Ludovic, and he certainly does need somebody to look after him. He's neglected. He looks frayed. You can see that for yourself. That old aunt of his looks after his house in some fashion, but she doesn't look after him.' and he's coming now to the age when a man needs to be looked after and coddled a bit. I'm lonesome here, and Ludovic is lonesome up there, and it does seem ridiculous, doesn't it? it. I don't wonder that we're the standing joke of Grafton. Goodness knows I laugh at it enough myself. I sometimes thought that if Ludovic could be made jealous it might spur him along. But I never could flirt, and there's nobody to flirt with if I could. Everybody hereabouts looks on me as Ludovic's property, and nobody would dream of interfering with him. Theodora cried Anne, I have a plan. Now, what are you going to do? exclaimed Theodora. Anne told her. At first Theodora laughed and protested. In the end she yielded somewhat doubtfully, overborne by Anne's enthusiasm. We'll try it then, she said resignedly. If Ludovic gets mad and leaves me, I'll be worse off than ever. But nothing venture, nothing win. And there is a fighting chance, I suppose. Besides, I must admit I'm tired of his dilly dallying. Anne went back to Echo Lodge, tingling with delight in her plot. She hunted up Arnold Sherman and told him what was required of him. Arnold Sherman listened and laughed. He was an elderly widower, an intimate friend of Stephen Irving, and had come down to spend part of the summer with him and his wife in Prince Edward Island. He was a handsome, in a mature style, and he had a dash of mischief in him still, so that he entered readily enough into Anne's plan. It amused him to think of hurrying Ludovic speed, and he knew that Theodora Dix could be depended upon to do her part. The comedy would not be dull, whatever its outcome. The curtain rose on the first act after prayer meeting on the next Thursday night. It was bright moonlight when the people came out of church, and everybody saw it plainly. Arnold Sherman stood upon the steps close to the door, and Ludovic Speed leaned up against a corner of the graveyard fence, as he had done for years. The boy said he had worn the paint off that particular place. Ludovic knew of no reason why he should paste himself up against the sh church door. Theodora would come out as usual, and he would join her as she went past the corner. This was what happened. Theodora came down the steps, her stately figure outlined in darkness against the gush of lamplight from the porch. Arnold Sherman asked her if he might see her home. Theodora took his arm calmly, and together they swept past the stupefied Ludovic, who stood helplessly gazing after them, as if unable to believe his eyes. For a few moments he stood there limply, then he started down the road after his fickle lady and her new admirer. The boys and irresponsible young men crowded after, expecting some excitement, but they were disappointed. Ludovic strode on until he overtook Theodora and Arnold Sherman, and then fell meekly in behind them. When she and Arnold turned in at her gate, Ludovic had to stop. Theodora looked over her shoulder and saw him standing still on the road. His forlorn figure haunted her thoughts all night. If Anne had not run over the next day and bolstered up her convictions, she might have spoiled everything by prematurely relenting. Ludovic, meanwhile, st stood still on the road, quite oblivious to the hoots and comments of the vastly amused small boy contingent until Theodora and his rival disappeared from his view under the firs in the hollow of her lane. Then he turned about and went home, not with his usual leisurely amble, but with a perturbed stride which proclaimed his inward disquiet. He felt bewildered. If the world had suddenly had come suddenly to an end, or if the lazy, meandering Grafton River had turned about and flowed up the hill, Ludovic could not have been more astonished. For fifteen years he had walked home from meetings with Theodora, and now, this elderly stranger, with all the glamour of the States hanging about him, had coolly walked off with her under Ludovic's very nose. Worst, most unkindest cut of all, Theodora had gone with him willingly. Nay, she had evidently enjoyed his company. Ludovic felt a stirring of righteous anger in his easy-going soul. When he reached the end of his lane, he paused at his gate and looked at his house, set back from the lane in a crescent of birches. 
Even in the moonlight, its weather-worn aspect was plainly visible. He thought of the palatial residence rumor ascribed to Arnold Sherman in Boston, and stroked his chin nervously with his sunburnt fingers. Then he doubled up his fist and struck it smartly on the gate post. Theodora needn't think she is going to jilt me in this fashion, after keeping company with me for fifteen years, he said. I'll have something to say to it, Arnold Sherman or no Arnold Sherman, the impudence of the puppy. The next morning Ludovic drove to Carmody and engaged Joshua Pye to come and paint his house, and that evening, although he was not due till Saturday night, he went down to see Theodora. Arnold Sherman was there before him, and was actually sitting in Ludovic's own prescriptive chair. Ludovic had to deposit himself in Theodora's new wicker rocker, where he looked and felt lamentably out of place. If Theodora felt the situation to be awkward, she carried it off superbly. She had never looked handsomer, and Ludovic perceived that she wore her second-best silk dress. He wondered miserably if she had donned it in expectation of his rival's call. She had never put on silk dresses for him. Ludovic had always been the meekest and mildest of mortals, but he felt quite murderous as he sat mutely there and listened to Arnold Sherman's polished conversation. You should just have been there to see him glowering, Theodora told the delighted Anne the next day. It may be wicked of me, but I felt real glad. I was afraid he might stay away and sulk. So long as he comes here and sulks, I don't worry. But he is feeling badly enough, poor soul, and I'm really eaten up by remorse. He tried to outstay Mr. Sherman last night, but he didn't manage it. You never saw a more depressed-looking creature than he was as he hurried down the lane. Yes, he actually hurried. The following Sunday evening Arnold Sherman walked to church with Theodora and sat with her. When they came in, Ludovic Speed suddenly stood up in his pew under the gallery. He sat down again at once, but everybody in view had seen him, and that night folks in all the length and breadth of Grafton River discussed the dramatic occurrence with keen enjoyment. Yes, he jumped right up as if he was pulled on his feet, while the minister was reading the chapter, said his cousin, Lorella Speed, who had been in church to her sister, who had not. His face was as white as a sheet, and his eyes were just glaring out of his head. I never felt so thrilled, I declare. I almost expected him to fly at them then and there. But he just gave a sort of gasp and sat down again. I don't know whether Theodore Dick saw him or not. She looked as cool and unconcerned as you please. Theodore had not seen Ludovic, but if she looked cool and unconcerned, her appearance belied her, for she felt miserably flustered. She could not prevent Arnold Sherman coming to church with her, but it seemed to her like going too far. People did not go to church and sit together in Grafton, unless they were the next thing to being engaged. What if this filled Ludovic with the narcotic of despair instead of waking him up? She sat through the service in misery and heard not one word of the sermon. But Ludovic's spectacular performances were not yet over. The speeds might be hard to get started, but once they were started their momentum was irresistible. When Theodora and Mr. Sherman came out, Ludovic was waiting on the steps. He stood up, straight and stern, with his head thrown back and his shoulders squared. There was open defiance in the look he cast on his rival, and masterfulness in the mere touch of the hand he laid on Theodora's arm. "'May I see you home, Miss Dix?' his word said. His tone said, "'I am going to see you home, whether or no.' Theodora, with a depreciating look at Arnold Sherman, took his arm, and Ludovic marched her across the green, amid a silence which the very horses tied to the storm-fence seemed to share. For Ludovic t'was a crowded hour of glorious life. Anne walked all the way over from Avonlea the next day to hear the news. Theodora smiled consciously. "'Yes, it is really settled at last, Anne. Coming home last night, Ludovic asked me plump and plain to marry him. Sunday and all, as it was. It's to be right away, for Ludovic won't be put off an, a week longer than necessary. So Ludovic Speed has been hurried up to some purpose at last, said Mr. Sherman, when Anne called in at Echo Lodge, brimful with her news. And you are delighted, of course, and my poor pride must be the scapegoat. I shall always be remembered in Grafton as the man from Boston who wanted Theodore Dix and couldn't get her. But that won't be true, you know, said Anne comfortably. Arnold Sherman thought of Theodora's ripe beauty and the mellow companionableness that she had revealed in their brief intercourse. "'I'm not perfectly sure of that,' he said, with a half-sigh. End of The Hurrying of Ludovic
Melinda's Humorous Story by May McHenry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read and recorded by Betsy Bush, Marquette, Michigan, June 2007. Melinda's Humorous Story by May McHenry. Melinda was dejected. She told herself that she was groping in the veil of despair, that life was a vast gray echoing void. She decided that ambition was dead, a case of starvation, that friendship had slipped through two eagerly grasping fingers, that love, ah, love. You'd better take a dose of bloomess, her aunt suggested when she had sighed seven times dolefully at the tea table. Not blue, miss. Any other kind of mass you please, but not blue. Melinda shuddered absently. No, she was not physically ill. The trouble was deeper. Soul sickness, acute, threatening to become chronic, that defied allopathic doses of favorite and other philosophers, that would not yield even to hourly repetition of the formula handed down from her grandmother. If you cannot have what you want, try to want what you have. Yet she could lay her finger on no bleeding heart wound, on no definite cause. It was true that the deeply analytical, painstakingly interesting historical novel on which she had worked all winter had been sent back from the publishers with a briefly polite note of thanks and regrets. But as she had never expected anything else, that could not depress her. Also, the slump in G.C. Copperstock had forced her to give up her long-planned southern trip, and even to forego the consolatory purchase of a spring gown. But she had a mind that could soar above flesh-pot disappointments. Then the Reverend John Graham. But what John Graham did or said was nothing, absolutely nothing to her. So Melinda clenched her hands and moaned in the same key with the east wind, and told the four walls of her room that she could not endure it. She must do something. Then it was, that in a flash of inspiration it came to her. She would write a humorous story. The artistic fitness of the idea pleased her. She had always understood that humorists were marked by a deep-dyed melancholy that the height of unhappiness was a vantage-ground from which to view the joke of existence. She would test the dictum. Now, if ever, she would write humorously. The material was at hand, seething and crowding in her mind. In fact, the monumental dullness and complacent narrowness of the villagers, the egoism, the conceit, the bland shepherd of his flock pomposity of John Graham. What more could a humorist desire? Yes, she would write. Thoughts came quick and fast. Words flowed in a fiery stream like lava that glows and rushes and curls and leaps down the mountain, sweeping all obstacles aside. The figure did not wholly please Melinda, for everybody knows how dull and gray and uninteresting lava is when it cools, but she had no time to bother with another. She felt the exaltation, the joy and uplifting of spirit that is the reward, usually, alas, the sole reward, of the writer in the work of creation. Then, before the lava had time to cool, she sent the story to the first magazine on her list, with a name beginning with A. It was her custom to send them that way, though sometimes, with a desire to be impartial, she commenced at Z and went up the list. At the end of two weeks the wind had ceased blowing from the east. Melinda decided that though life for her must be gray, echoing, void, yet would she make an effort for the joy of others. She would lift herself above the depression that enfolded her, even as the buoyant hyacinths were cleaving their dark husks, and lifting up the beauty and fragrance of their hearts to solace passers-by. Therefore she ceased parting her hair in the middle, and ordered a simple little frock from D's. Hyacinth blue voil, with a lining that should whisper and rustle like the glad winds whisking away last year's leaves. Then the day came when she strolled carelessly and unexpectedly down the village street to the post office, 
and there received a letter that bore on the upper left-hand corner of the envelope the name of the magazine first on her list, beginning with A. A chill passed along Melinda's spine. That humorous story, could this mean? It was too horrible to contemplate. She took a short cut through the orchard, and as she walked she tore off a corner and peeped into the envelope. Yes, there was a pale blue slip of paper with serrated edges. She leaned against a Baldwin apple tree to think. How true it is that one should be prepared for the unexpected. Melinda had sent out many manuscripts freighted with tingling hopes and eager aspirations, and with the postage stamps that ensured their prompt return. How was she to know? By what process of reasoning could she infer that this, that had been offered simply from force of habit, would be retained in exchange for an aesthetically tinted check? She anathematized the magazine editor. That seems the proper thing to do with editors. She wanted to know what business he had to keep that story after having led her to believe that it was his unbearable custom to send them back. It was deception, she told the swelling Baldwin buds, base deep dyed subtle deception. After baiting her on with his little pink printed rejection slips, he suddenly sprung a wicked trap. It was some time before Melinda grew calm enough to read the editorial letter. It ran, Dear Madam, we are glad to have your tender and delicately sympathetic picture of village life. There is a note of true sentiment and a generous appreciation of homely virtue marking this story, for which we desire to add an especial word of praise. Check enclosed. Very truly yours, the editor of A. Melinda sank limply on the bleached last year's grass at the foot of the tree. Tender and delicately sympathetic picture. Generous appreciation. She laughed feebly. The editor was pleased to be facetious. Having a fine sense of humor himself, he showed his realization of the story by acknowledging it in the same vein of subtle satire. She reread the letter and unfolded the slip of paper with serrated edges, with changing emotions. After all, it was not such a very bad story. She permitted herself to recall how humorous it was, how cleverly and keenly it laid bare the ridiculous, the unexpected, how it scintillated with wit and abounded in droll and subtle distinctions and descriptions, all, all at the expense of her nearest relatives and her dearest friends. Melinda thought she would return the check and demand that her story be sent back to her or destroyed. But, reflecting that Punch's advice is applicable to other things than matrimony and suicide, she didn't. She resolutely put her literary Frankenstein behind her. She reasoned that, in all probability, the story would not be published during the lifetime of any of the originals of the characters, that even if the worst came to the worst, Mossdale would likely to remain in ignorance that would be blissful. The villagers were not wont to waste time on the printed word. In fact, such was the profundity of their unenlightenment, few of them had heard of the magazine with a name beginning with A. Even John Graham paid little attention to the secular periodicals. Besides, if absolutely necessary, John's attention might be diverted. So Melinda went away on a visit. Her health demanded it. The doctor was unable to name her malady. But she herself diagnosed it as magazineitis. Toward fall, Melinda, entirely recovered, returned to Mossdale. Entirely recovered, yet she turned cold, unseeing eyes on the newsboy when he passed through the car with his towering load of vari-colored periodicals, and rather than be forced to the final resort of the unaccompanied traveler, she welcomed the advent of an acquaintance possessed of volubility of an ejaculatory eruptive variety. After many gentle jets and spurts of gossip, which remained to be told, as the lady hastily gathered up her impedimenta preparatory to alighting at her home station. "'How like me in the joy of seeing you to forget! What a sweet, clever story! And to think of you having something published in A! I never was more surprised than when Mr. Ferguson brought home the magazine. Those delicious Mossdale people! I could not endure that the dear things should not see and know at once— the lovely hamlet is so, so remote, and I know you were traveling. 
What a pleasure to send them half a dozen copies that very evening. Yes, Porter, that too. Do run down to see me soon, dear. Now do. Good-bye. Melinda summoned the newsboy and bought the latest number of the magazine with a name beginning with A. She turned to the list of contents with feverish anxiety. Then the book slid from her nerveless fingers. Her humorous story had been given to an eager public. She leaned back and gazed at the flying telegraph poles and fields. Even the worthiest, the gravest, the finest, she reflected, has a face that, if seen in a certain light, will flash out the ignis fatus of the ridiculous. But it is not usually considered the office of friendship to turn on the betraying light. Oh, well, her relatives would forgive in time. Relatives have to forgive. It was unfortunate that John Graham was not a relative. One thing, I know now how much Mrs. Ferguson cares because I got those six votes ahead of her for the Thursday Club presidency. Half a dozen copies, Melinda said aloud as she caught sight of the spire of the Mossdale Church. Her Uncle Joe met her at the station and kissed her for the first time since she had put on long dresses. Notwithstanding a foolish prejudice against tobacco juice, Melinda received the salute in a meek and contrite spirit. Notice how many citizens were hanging around underfoot on the depot platform, so as you kinder had to stop and shake hands to get em out o' the way? Uncle Joe queried as he turned the colt's heads toward home. Melinda had noticed. I suppose they came out to see the train come in, she suggested. Nope, not exactly, Uncle Joe explained. Looking out for automobiles and flying airships have made trains of cars seem mighty common up this way. Nope. The folks was out on account of you a-comin'. Me? Having a guilty conscience, Melinda glanced backward apprehensively and made a motion as though to dodge a missile. Yep, and you'll find a lot of the relations at the house a-waitin' for you. Why, what? Now look here, Uncle Joe. There is no occasion to be foolish about a little— Foolish? Now maybe some would call it foolish— but us folks up the creek here, we can't help feelin' set up some over findin' out we have a second Milton or a Mrs. Stowe in the family. Melinda looked at her relative's concave profile in sick suspicion. Was the trail of the serpent over them all? But no, Uncle Joe was beaming mildly with the satisfaction of having shown that although the literary hemisphere was the unknown land, he had heard of a mountain and a minor elevation or two. He was, as she had always believed, incapable of satire. For once, Melinda was speechless, but Uncle Joe was likely to be fluent when he got started, and turned mild, suffused, half-shamed blue eyes on his shrinking niece. "'Yes, your piece has come out in the paper, Melinda, and your folks are all fired pleased with you. I told Lucy this morning I wished your poor pap would come back to earth for just this one day.' Ah! Melinda took a firm grip on the side of the buggy. But I guess you'll have to write another right off. There is some jealousy amongst them that aren't in it, Uncle Joe went on. I told them you couldn't put the whole connection in, or it would read like a list of them present at a surprise party. Your Aunt Lucy, she's just as tickled as a hen with three chickens, the old man chuckled. There it is, all down in black and white, just like it happened, only different about her spasm of economy when she was cleaning away Mary Emmeline's medicine bottles and couldn't bear to throw away what was left over, but up and took it all herself in one powerful mixed dose to save it, and had to have the doctor with a stomach pump to cure her of spasms, what wasn't so economical after all. It's her picture tickles her most. Oh, said Melinda. Yes, you know the picture is as slim as a girl in her first pair of cossets, a standin' on a chair, a reachin' bottles off a top shelf, and your Aunt Lucy's that hefty she ain't stood on a chair for ten years for fear it would break down, and she's had to trust the top shelf to the hired girl. I guess when she goes to heaven, she'll want to stop on the way up and fix that top shelf to suit her. So she just sits and looks at that picture and smiles and smiles. She likes my whiskers, too. Yes, she's always wanting me to wear whiskers, ever since we were married. 
but we never was a whiskery family, and they wouldn't seem to grow thicker than your Uncle Josh's corn when he planted it, one grain to the hill. But there I am in the picture in the paper, with real biblical whiskers reaching to the bottom of my vest. Uncle Joe cleared his throat and glanced sideways at his niece again. I want to tell you, Melindy, that I am real obliged to you for making me one of the main ones in the piece with a lot to say. Your Aunt Lucy says twas only right and proper, me being your nighest kin and you living with us. But I told her there was so many others that was smarter and more the story-paper kind that I thought it showed real good feeling on your part. Yes, I did. Get up there, Ginger. Then I kind of thought I'd warn you, too, Melindy, that they all are just a-dying to hear you say who the preacher is. He's the only one we couldn't quite place. Melinda took the little bottle of smelling salts from her bag and held it to her nose. Yes, Uncle Joe went on. The others was easy identified because you had named the names. But him you just called the preacher all the way through. Some says it's the Reverend Graham, kind of toned down and trimmed up, like things you see in the moonlight on a summer night. But I told them the Reverend Graham is a nice enough chap but that that extra fine way-up preacher fellow in the story must be some stranger you knew from off, and didn't give his name because you didn't rightly know what it was. I thought, even if you was so soft on Reverend Graham as to see him in that illusory moony light, that about the stranger from off was the right and proper thing for me, being your uncle, to say anyway. So if you want to keep it dark about the preacher, you can. Just talk about a stranger from off." "'I will, Uncle Joe, dear Uncle Joe,' Melinda exclaimed gratefully as they stopped in front of the gate. Melinda greeted her relatives with a warmth and enthusiasm that embarrassed and made them suspicious. She was not usually so complacent, so solicitous for the health and progress of offspring. Above all, she was not usually so loath to talk about herself. She acted as though she had never written a story— yet three copies of it were spread open under her nose, one on the piano, one on the parlor table, one on the sideboard, all open at the passage about the preacher. The relatives retired in disgust. With the departure of the last one, Melinda seized a magazine and fled to the orchard. She would read that story herself. As she turned the leaves, she caught sight of a manly form carefully climbing the fence. She dropped the periodical and stood on it, gazing up pensively into the well-laden boughs of the Baldwin. The Reverend Graham took her hands in a strong ministerial squeeze. "'It is very good of you to come to see me so soon after my return,' she faltered. "'Good, Melinda. Do you think I could help coming?' he ejaculated. "'I cannot tell you. Words are inadequate to express what I feel,' he went on. The deep gratitude, the humility, the wonder, the triumph, the determination with God's aid to live up to the high ideal you have set forth in your wonderful story. You have seen the latent qualities, the nobler potentialities. You have shown me to myself. Melinda, do not think that I do not appreciate the difficulties of this hour for you. I know how your heart is shrinking, how your delicate maidenly modesty is up in arms. "'But, Melinda, you know, you know, dear Melinda.' "'I am glad you understand me, John.' "'Understand you!' The Reverend Graham could restrain himself no longer. He swept her into his arms, appropriating his own. Melinda remained there, quiescently leaning against his shoulder, because there seemed nothing else to do, also because it was a broad and comfortable shoulder against which to lean. I am done for, she reflected. Now I will never dare to confess that I was trying to write humorous. Then she reached up a hand and touched the preacher's face timidly. His cheek was wet. Why, John, John, she whispered. End of Melinda's Humorous Story by May McHenry The Red Etten of the Blue Fairy Book this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne Alexander. The Blue Fairy Book by Andrew Lang, The Red Etten. 
the Red Etten. There were ains twa widows that lived in a small bit of ground which they rented from a farmer. In of them had twa sons, and the other had ain. And by and by it was time for the wife that had twa sons to send them away to seek their fortune. So she told her eldest son one day to take a can and bring her water from the well, that she might bake a cake for him, and however much or however little water he might bring, the cake would be great or small accordingly, and that cake was to be all that she could give him when he went on his travels. The lad gave away with the can to the well and filled it with water, and then came away him again. But the can being broken, the mace part of the water had run out before he got back, so his cake was very small. Yet, small as it was, his mother asked if he was willing to take the half of it with her blessing, telling him that if he chose rather to have the hail, he would only get it with her curse. The young man, thinking he might he to travel a far way and not knowing when or how he might get other provisions, said he'd like to eat the hail cake, come his mother's malice on what may. So she gave him the hail cake and her malice on a lying weight. Then he took his brother aside and gave him a knife to keep till he should come back, desiring him to look at it every morning, and as long as it continued to be clear, then he might be sure that the owner of it was well. But if it grew dim and rusty then for certain some ill had befallen him. So the young man set out to seek his fortune. And he gave all that day and all the next day, and on the third day in the afternoon he came up to where a shepherd was sitting with a flock of sheep. And he got up to the shepherd and asked him what the sheep belonged to. And the man answered, The Red Etten of Ireland, and slived in Billy Gam, and stole King Malcolm's daughter, the King of Fair Scotland. He beats her, he binds her, he lays her on a band, and every night he dings her with a bright silver wand, like Julian the Roman. He's one that fears no man. It's said there's ain predestinate to be his mortal foe, but that man is yet unborn. Lying may it be so. The young man then went on his journey, and he had not gone far when he espied an old man with white locks herding a flock of swine, and he got up to him and he asked, Whose swine were these? When the man answered, The Red Etten of Ireland, then lived in Billygam, and stole King Malcolm's daughter, the King of Fair Scotland. He beats her, he binds her, he lays her on a band, and every day he dings her with a bright silver wand. Like Julian the Roman, he's one that fears no man. It's said there's ain't predestinate to be his mortal foe, but that man is yet unborn, and lying may it be so. Then the young man gave on a bit further, and came to another very old man, herding goats. And when he asked whose goats they were, the answer was, The Red Etten of Ireland, and lived in Bellingham, and stole King Malcolm's daughter, the King of Fair Scotland. He beats her, he binds her, he lays her on a band, and every night he dings her with a bright silver wand. Like Julian the Roman, he's one that fears no man. It's said there's ain't predestinate to be his mortal foe, but that man is yet unborn, and lying may it be so. This old man also told him to beware of the next beasts that he should meet, for they were of a very different kind from any he had yet seen. So the young man went on, and by and by he saw a multitude of very dreadful beasts. Ilk in of them were twa heads, and on every head four horns, and he was sore threatened, and ran away from them as fast as he could, and glad was he when he came to a castle that stood in a hillock with the door standing wide to the wall. And he got into the castle for shelter, and there he saw an old wife sitting beside the kitchen fire. He asked the wife if he might stay there for the night as he was tired. Well, long journey, and the wife said he might, but it was not a good place for him to be in, as it belonged to the Red Etten who was a very terrible beast with three heads that spared no living man he could get hold of. The young man would have gone away, but he was afraid of the beasts on the outside of the castle, so he beseeched the old woman to conceal him as well she could, and not to tell the Etten he was there. He thought if he could put over the night, he might get away in the morning without meeting with the beasts and so escape. But he had not been long in his hidey-hole before the awful Etten came in, and no sooner was he in than he was heard crying, 
Snook, but and snook, Ben, I find the smell of an earthly man. Be he living or be he dead, his heart this night shall kitchen my bread. The monster soon found the poor young man and pulled him from his hole. And when he'd got him out, he told him that if he could answer him three questions, his life would be spared. The first was whether Ireland or Scotland was first inhabited. The second was whether man was made for woman or woman for man. And the third was whether men or brutes were made first. The lad, not being able to answer one of these questions, the Red Etten took a mace and knocked him on the head and turned him into a pillar of stone. On the morning after this happened, the younger brother took out the knife to look at, and he was grieved to find it all brown with rust. He told his mother that the time now had come for him to go away in his travels also. So she requested him to take the can to the well for water, that she might bake a cake for him. The can being broken, he brought him as little water as the other had done, and the cake was as little. She asked whether he would have the hail cake where Malison or the half were blessing. And like his brother, he thought it best to have the hail cake come with the malice and what might. So he gave away, and everything happened to him that had happened to his brother. The other widow and her son heard of all that had happened for a fairy, and the young man determined that he would also go upon his travels and see if he could do anything to relieve his twelve friends. So his mother gave him a can to go to the well and bring home water that she might bake him a cake for his journey. And he gave, and as he was bringing him the water, a raven, the hour of his head, cried to him to look. And he would see that the water was running out. And he was a young man of sense. And seeing the water running out, he took some clay and patched up the holes. So he brought home enough water to bake a large cake. When his mother put it to him to take the half cake where blessing, he took it in preference to having the hail where malison, and yet the half was bigger than what the other lads had got altogether. So he get away in his journey, and after he travelled a fair way he met with an old woman that asked him if he would give her a bit of his bannock, and he said he'd gladly do that, so he gave her a piece of the bannock, and for that she gave him a magical wand that she said might yet be of service to him, if he took care to use it rightly. Then the old woman, who was a fairy, told him a great deal that would happen to him, and what he ought to do in all circumstances. And after that, she vanished in an instant out of his sight. He got on a great way further, and then he came to the old man herding the sheep. And when he asked whose sheep these were, the answer was, The Red Etten of Ireland, and Slyvan Ballygam, and stole King Malcolm's daughter, the King of Fair Scotland. He beats her, he binds her, he lays her on a band, and every day he dings her with a bright silver wand. And like Julian the Roman, he's one that fears no man, but now I fear his end is near, and destiny at hand. And you're to be, I plainly see, the heir of all his land. The young man then went on his journey. And he had not gone far when he espied an old man with white locks herding a flock of swine. And he got up to him and he asked whose swine these were. When the man answered, The Red Etten of Ireland in Slyvan Bellingham and stole King Malcolm's daughter, the King of Fierce Scotland. He beats her, he binds her, he lays her on a band, and every day he dings her with a bright silver wand. Like Julian the Roman, he's one that fears no man, but now I hear his end is near, and destiny at hand, and you're to be, I plainly see, the heir o' this land. Then the young man get on a bit further and came to another very old man herding goats, and when he asked whose goats they were, the answer was, the Red Etten of Ireland, and slived in Bellygam, and stole King Malcolm's daughter, the King of Fair Scotland. He beats her, he binds her, he lays her on a band, and every day he dings her with a bright silver wand. Like Julian the Roman, he's one that fears no man, but now I fear his end is near, and destiny at hand, and you're to be, I plainly see, the heir of all his land. This old man also told him to beware of the next beasts that he should meet, for they were of a very different kind from any he had yet seen. 
When he came to the place where the monstrous beasts were standing, he did not stop nor run away, but went boldly through among them. One came up roaring with an open mouth to devour him, when he struck it with his wand, and laid it in an instant dead at his feet. He soon came to the Etten's castle, where he knocked and was admitted. The old woman that sat by the fire warned him of the terrible Etten and what had been the fate of the two brothers, but he was not to be daunted. The monster soon came in, saying, Snouk but and snouk ben, I find the smell of an earthly man. Be he living or be he dead, his heart shall be kitchen to my bread. He quickly espied the young man and bade him come forth on the floor, and then he put the three questions to him. But the young man had been told everything by the good fairy, so he was able to answer all the questions. When the Etten found this, he knew his power was gone. The young man then took up the axe and hewed off the monster's three heads. He next asked the old woman to show him where the king's daughter lay, and the old woman took him upstairs and opened a great many doors, and out of every door came a beautiful lady who had been imprisoned there by the Etten. And in of these ladies was the king's daughter. She also took him down into a low room, and there stood two stone pillars. They had only to touch with his wand when his two friends and neighbours started into life. And the hail of the prisoners were overjoyed at their deliverance, which they all acknowledged to be owing to the prudent young man. Next day they all set out for the king's court, and a gallant company they made. And the king married his daughter to the young man that had delivered her, and gave a noble's daughter to Elkin of the other men. So they all lived happily all the rest of their days. Chambers, Popular Traditions of Scotland End of the Red Etten Recording by Marianne Alexander's Citrusites Barefacebears.net The Stick in the Muds by Rupert Hughes This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Deborah Lynn in Northern Lower Michigan, July 2007. The Stick in the Muds by Rupert Hughes, from Collier's Weekly. A skiff went prowling along the Avon River in the unhurried English twilight that releases the sunset with reluctance, and defers luxuriously the roll-call of the stars. The skiff floated low, for the man alone in it was heavy, and he was in no greater haste than the northern light, which was against the traditions, for he was an American, an American business man. He was making his way through the sky-hued water stealthily, lest he disturb the leisure of the swans, drowsy above their own images, lest he discourage the nightingale trying a few low flute-notes in the cathedral tower of shadow that was a tree above the tomb of Shakespeare. The American had never heard a nightingale, and it was his first pilgrimage to the shrine of the actor-manager whose productions Americans curiously couple with the Bible as sacred lore. During the day Joel Wixon had seen the sights of Stratford with the others from his country and from England and the continent. But now he wanted to get close to Shakespeare, so he hired the skiff and declined the services of the old boat lender. And now he was stealing up into the rich gloom the church spread across the river. He was pushing the stern of the boat foremost, so that he could feast his eyes. He was making so little speed that the only sounds were the choked sob of the water where the boat cleaved it gently and the tinkle of the drops that fell from the lazy oars was something of the delicate music of the uncertain nightingale. Being a successful business man, Wixon was a suffocated poet. The imagination and the passion and the orderliness that brought him money were the same energies that would have made him a success in verse, but lines were not his line, and he was inarticulate and incoherent when beauty overwhelmed him, as it did in nearly every form. He shivered now before the immediate majesty of the scene, 
and the historic meanings that enriched it as with an embroidered heiress. Yet he gave out no more words than an Aetolian harp shuddering with ecstasy in a wind too gentle to make it audible. In such moods he hunted solitude, for he was ashamed to be seen, afraid to be observed in the raptures that did not belong in the vocabulary of a business man. He had talked at noon about the fact that he and Shakespeare's father were in wool, and he had annoyed a few modest Americans by comparing the petty amount of the elder Shakespeare's trade with the vast total pouring from his own innumerable looms driven with the electricity that the Shakespeare's had never dreamed of. He had redeemed himself for his pretended brag by a meek admission, but I'm afraid my boy will never write another Hamlet. Yet what could he know of his own son? How little Will Shakespeare's father or his scandalized neighbors could have fancied that the scapegrace good-for-naught who left the town for the town's good would make it immortal, and coming back to die and lie down forever beside the Avon would bring a world of pilgrims to a new Mecca, the shrine of the supreme unique poet of all human time. A young boy even now was sauntering the path along the other shore, so lazily tossing pebbles into the stream that the swans hardly protested. It came upon Wixon with a kind of silent lightning that Shakespeare had once been such another boy, skipping pebbles across the narrow river and peering up into the trees to find out where the nightingale lurked. Perhaps three hundred years from now some other shrine would claim the pilgrims, the home, perhaps, of some American boy now groping through the amber mists of adolescence, or some man as little revered by his own neighbors and rivals as the man Shakespeare was when he went back to Avon to send back to London his two plays a year to the theatres. Being a practical man, which is a man who strives to make his visions palpable, Wixon thought of his own home town and the colony of boys that prospered there in the Middle West. He knew that no one would seek the town because of his birth there, for he was but a buyer of fleeces, a carter of wools, a spinner of threads, and a weaver of fabrics to keep folks' bodies warm. His weaves wore well, but they wore out. The weavers of words were the ones whose fabrics lasted beyond the power of time and mocked the moths. Was there any such spinner in Carthage to give the town eternal blazon to ears of flesh and blood? There was one who might have been the man if— Suddenly he felt himself again in Carthage. There was a river there, too, not a little bolt of chatoyant silk like the Avon, which they would have called a crick back there. Before Carthage ran the incomprehensible floods of old Mississippi himself, father of waters, deep and vast and swift. They had lately swung a weir across it to make it work, a concrete wall a mile wide and more, and its tumbling cascades spun no little mill-wheels, but swirled thundering turbines that lighted cities and ran street-cars a hundred miles away. And yet it had no Shakespeare. And yet again it might have had if— The twilight was so deep now that he shipped his oars in the gloom and gave himself back to the past. He was in another twilight, only it was the counter-twilight between star-quench and sun-blaze. Two small boys, himself one of them, his sworn chum Luke Mellows the other, meeting in the silent street just as the day-tide seeped in from the east and submerged the stars. Joel had tied a string to his big toe and hung it from his window. Luke had done the same. They were not permitted to explode alarm clocks and ruin the last sweets of sleep in either home, so they had agreed that the first to wake should rise and dress with stealth, slip down the dark stairs of his house, into the starlit street, and over to the other's home, and pull the toe-cord. On this morning Luke had been the earlier out, and his triumphant yanks had dragged Joel feet first from sleep, and from the bed, and almost through the window. Joel had howled protests in shrill whispers down into the gloom, and then, untying his outraged toe, had limped into his clothes and so to the yard. The two children in the huge world, disputed still by the night, had felt in awe of the sky and the mysteries going on there. The envied man who ran up the streets of evenings, lighting the gas street lamps, was abroad again already with his little ladder and his quick insect-like motions— 
only now he was turning out the lights, just as a similar but invisible being was apparently running around heaven and putting out the stars. Joel remembered saying, "'I wonder if they're turning off the stars up there to save gas, too.' Luke did not like the joke. He said, using the word funny solemnly, "'It's funny to see light putting out light. The stars will be there all day, but we won't be able to see them for the sun.' Wixom thought of this now, and of how Shakespeare's fame had drowned out so many stars. A man had told him that there were hundreds of great writers in Shakespeare's time that most people never heard of. As the boys paused, the air quivered with a hoarse moo, as of a gigantic cow bellowing for her lost calf. It was really a steamboat whistling for the bridge to open the draw and let her through to the south with her raft of logs. Both of the boys called the boat by name, knowing her voice. "'It's the Bessie May Brown!' They started on a run to the bluff overlooking the river, their short legs making a full mile of the scant furlong. Often as Joel had come out upon the edge of that bluff on his innumerable journeys to the river for fishing, swimming, skating, or just staring, it always smote him with the thrill Balboa must have felt coming suddenly upon the Pacific. On this morning there was an unwanted grandeur. The whole vault of the sky was curdled with the dawn a reef of solid black in the west turning to purple and to amber, and finally in the east to scarlet, with a few late planets caught in the meshes of the sunlight and trembling like dew on a spider's web. And the battle in the sky was repeated in the sea-like river, with all of the added magic of the current and the eddies and the wimpling rushes of the dawn winds. On the great slopes were houses and farmsteads throwing off the night, and in the river the Bessie May Brown, her red light and her green light, trailing scarfs of color on the river as she chuffed and clanged her bell and smote the water with her stern wheel. In the little steeple of the pilot-house a priest guided her and her unwieldy acre of logs between the piers of the bridge, whose lanterns were still belatedly aglow on the girders, and again an echo in the flood. Joel filled his little chest with a gulp of morning air and found no better words for his rhapsody than, "'Gee, but ain't it great?' To his amazement, Luke, who had always been more sensitive than he, shook his head and turned away. "'Gosh, what do you want for ten cents?' Joel demanded, feeling called upon to defend the worthiness of the dawn. Luke began to cry. He dropped down on his own bare legs in the weeds, and twisted his face and his fists in a vain struggle to fight off unmanly grief. Joel squatted at his side and insisted on sharing the secret, and finally Luke forgot the sense of family honor long enough to yield to the yearning for company in his misery. "'I was up here at midnight last night, and I don't like this place any more.' "'You didn't come all by yourself. Gee!' "'No, Mama was here, too.' "'What'd she bring you out here at a time like that for?' "'She didn't know I was here.' "'Didn't know? What's she doing out here, then?' "'She and Papa had a turbo quarrel. "'I couldn't hear what started it, but finally it woke me up and I listened, "'and Mama was crying and Papa was swearing, "'and at last Mama said, "'Oh, I might as well go and throw myself in the river, "'and Papa said, "'Good riddance of bad rubbish.' And Mama stopped crying, and she says, "'All right,' in an awful kind of a voice, and I heard the front door open and shut. "'Gee!' Well, I jumped into my shirt and pants and slid down the rain-pipe and ran along the street, and there, sure enough, was Mama walking as fast as she could. I was afraid to go near her. I don't know why, but I was, so I just sneaked along after her. The street was black as pitch, except for the street lamps, and as she passed every one I could see she was still crying and stumbling along like she was blind. It was so late we didn't meet anybody at all, and there wasn't a light in a single house except Jones's, where somebody was sick, I guess, but they didn't pay any attention, and at last she came to the bluff here, and I followed. When she got where she could see the river she stopped and stood there, and held her arms out like she was going to jump off or fly or something. The moon was up, and the river was so bright you could hardly look at it, and Mama stood there with her arms way out like she was on the cross or something. 
I was so scared and so cold, I shook like I had a chill. I was afraid she could hear my teeth chatter, and so I dropped down in the weeds and thistles to keep her from seeing me. It was just along about here, too. By and by, Mama kind of broke like somebody had hit her. Then she began to cry again and to walk up and down, wringing her hands. Once or twice she started to run down the bluff, and I started to follow her, but she stopped like somebody held her back, and I sunk down again. Then, after a long time, she shook her head like she couldn't, and turned back. She walked right by me and didn't see me. I heard her whispering, I can't, I can't, my poor children. Then she went back down the street, and me after her, wishing I could go up and help her, but I was afraid she wouldn't want me to know, and I just couldn't go near her. Luke wept helplessly at the memory of his poltroonery, and Joel tried roughly to comfort him with questions. Gee, I don't blame you. I don't guess I could have either. But what was it all about, do you suppose? I don't know. Mama went to the front door, and it was locked, and she stood a long, long while before she could bring herself to knock. Then she tapped on it, soft-like. And by and by, Papa opened the door and said, Oh, you're back, are you? Then he turned and walked away, and she went in. I could have killed him with a rock if she hadn't shut the door. But all I could do was to climb back up the rain-pipe. I was so tired and discouraged I nearly fell and broke my neck, and I wished I had of. But there wasn't any more quarrel, only Mama kind of whimpered once or twice, and Papa said, Oh, for God's sake, shut up and leave me sleep. I got to open the store in the morning, ain't I? I didn't do much sleeping, and I guess that's why I woke up first. That was all of the story that Joel could learn. The two boys were shut out by the wall of grown-up life. Luke crouched in bitter moodiness, throwing clods of dirt at early grasshoppers and reconquering his lost dignity. At last he said, "'If you ever let on to anybody what I told you—' "'Ah, oh, say!' was Joel's protest. His knighthood as a sworn chum was put in question, and he was cruelly hurt. Luke took assurance from his dismay and said in a burst of fury, "'Ah, oh, I just said that. I know you won't tell. But just you wait till I can earn a pile of money. I'll take Mama away from that old scoundrel so fast it'll make his head swim.' Then he slumped again. "'But it takes so doggone long to grow up, and I don't know how to earn anything.' Then the morning of the world caught into its irresistible vivacity the two boys in the morning of their youth— and before long they had forgotten the irremediable woes of their elders, as their elders also forgot the problems of national woes and cosmic despair. The boys descended the sidelong path at a jog, brushing the dew and grasshoppers and the birds from the hazel bushes and the paypaw shrubs, and scaring many a dewy rabbit from cover. At the bottom of the bluff the railroad track was the only road along the river, and they began the tormenting passage over the uneven ties with cinders everywhere for their bare feet. They postponed as long as they could the delight of breakfast, and then, sitting on a pile of ties, made a feast of such hard-boiled eggs, cookies, cheese, and crackers as they had been able to wheedle from their kitchens the night before. Their talk that morning was earnest, as boys' talk is apt to be. They debated their futures, as boys are apt to do. Being American boys, two things characterized their plans. One, that the sky itself was the only limit to their ambitions. The other, that they must not follow their father's businesses. Joel's father was an editor. Luke's kept a hardware store. So Joel wanted to go into trade, and Luke wanted to be a writer. The boys wrangled with the shrill intensity of youth. A stranger passing might have thought them about to come to blows, but they were simply noisy with earnestness. Their argument was as unlike one of the debates in Virgil's Ecologues as possible. It was an antistrophe of twang and drawl. "'Gee, you darned fool! What you want to go into business for?' "'Darned fool your own self! What you want to be a writer for?' Then they laughed wildly, struck at each other in mock hostility, and went on with their all-day walk returning at night too weary for books or even a game of authors or checkers. Both liked to read, and they were just emerging from the stratum of old Cap Collier, Nick Carter, the Kid Glove Miner, and the Steam Man, into Ivanhoe, Scottish Chiefs, and Cujo's Cave, 
They had passed out of the Oliver Optic, Harry Castleman, James Otis era. Joel Wixon read for excitement, Luke Mellows for information as to the machinery of authorship. Young as they were, they went to the theatre, to the opera house, which never housed opera. Joel went often and without price, since his father, being an editor, had the glorious prerogative of comps. Perhaps that was why Luke wanted to be a writer. Mr. Mellows, as hard as his own wear, did not believe in the theatre, and could not be bullied or wept into paying for tickets. But Luke became a programme boy and got in free, a precious privilege he kept secret as long as possible, and lost as soon as his father noticed his absences from home on play nights. Then he was whipped for wickedness in order to give up the theatre forever. Perhaps Luke would never suffer again so fiercely as he suffered from that denial. It meant a free education and a free revel in the frequent performances of Shakespeare, and of repertory companies that gave such triumphs as East Lynn and Camille, not to mention the road companies that played the uproarious Peck's Bad Boy, Over the Garden Wall, skipped by the light of the moon, and the Charles Hoyt screamers. The theatre had been a cloud-veiled Olympus of mystic exultations, of divine terrors, and of ambrosial laughter. But it was a bad influence. Mr. Mellows's theories of right and wrong were as simple and sharp as his own knives. Whatever was delightful and beautiful and laughterful was manifestly wicked, God having plainly devised the pretty things as baits for the devil's fish-hooks. Joel used to tell Luke about the plays he saw, and the exile's heart ached with envy. They took long walks up the river or across the bridge into the wonderlands that were overflowed in high-water times, and they talked always of their futures. Boyhood was a torment, a slavery. Heaven was just over the twenty-first birthday. Joel got his future, all but the girl he planned to take with him up the grand stairway of the palace he foresaw. Luke missed his future, and his girl, and all of his dreams. Between the boys and their manhood stood, as usual, the fathers, strange monsters, ogres, who seemed to have forgotten, at the top of the beanstalk, that they had once been boys themselves down below. After the early and unceasing misunderstandings as to motives and standards of honour and dignity came the civil war over education. Wouldn't you just know that each boy would get the wrong dad? Joel's father was proud of Luke and not of Joel. He had printed some of Luke's poems in the paper and called him a precocious native genius. Joel's father wished that his boy could have had his neighbor's boy's gift. It was his sorrow that Joel had none of the artistic leanings that are called gifts. He regretfully gave him up as one who would not carry on the torch his father had set out with. He could not force his child to be a genius, but he insisted that Joel should have an education. The editor had found himself handicapped by a lack of the mysterious enrichment that a tour through college gives the least absorbent mind. He was determined to provide it for his boy, though Joel felt that every moment's delay in leaping into the commercial arena was so much delay in arriving at gladiatorial eminence. Luke's father had had even less education than Editor Wixon, but he was proud of it. He had never gone far in the world, but he was one of those men who are automatically proud of everything they do, and derive even from failure or humiliation a savage conceit. He made Luke work in his store, or out of it, as a delivery boy during vacations from such school terms as the law required. He saw the value of education enough to make out bills and write dunning letters. Books, to him, meant the doleful books that bookkeepers keep. As for any further learning, he thought it a waste of time, a kind of wantonness. He felt that Providence had intentionally selected a cross for him in the son who was wicked and foolish enough to want to read stories and see plays and go to school for years instead of going right into business. The thought of sending his boy through a preparatory academy and college and wasting his youth on nonsense was outrageous. It maddened him to have the boy plead for such folly. He tried in vain to whip it out of him. Joel's ideas of education were exactly those of Mr. Mellows, but he did not like Mr. Mellows because of the anguish inflicted on Luke. 
Joel used to beg Luke to run away from home, but that was impracticable for two reasons. Luke was not of the runaway sort, but meek and shy and obedient to a fault. Besides, while a boy can run away from school, he cannot easily run away to school. If he did, he would be sent back. And if he were not sent back, how was he to pay for his tuition and his board and books and clothes? It was Luke's influence that sent Joel away to board and school. He so longed to go himself that Joel felt it foolish to deny himself the godlike opportunity. So Luke went to school vicariously in Joel, as he got his other experiences vicariously in books. At school, Joel found so much to do outside of his classes that he grew content to go all the way. There was a glee club to manage, also an athletic club, a paper to solicit ads and subscriptions for, class officers to be elected, with all the delights of political maneuvering, a world in little to run with all the solemnity and competition of the adult cosmos. So Joel was happy and lucky and successful in spite of himself. The day after Joel took train up the river to his academy, Luke took the position his father secured for him, and entered the little back room where the butterfly bottling works kept its bookkeepers on high stools. The butterfly soda pop, ginger ales, and other soft drinks were triumphs of insipidity, and their birch beer sickened the thirstiest child. But the making and the marketing and even the drinking of them were matters of high emprise compared to the keeping of the books. One of the saddest, sweetest, greatest stories ever written is Ellis Pigs's Pigs Butler's fable of the contented little donkey that went round and round in the mill and thought he was travelling far. But that donkey was blind and had no dreams denied. Luke Mellows was a boy, a boy that still felt his life in every limb, a boy devoured with fantastic ambitions. He had a genius within that smothered and struggled till it all but perished unexpressed. It lived only enough to be in anguish. It hurt him like a hidden, unmentioned, ingrowing toenail that cuts and bleeds and excruciates the fleet member it is meant to protect. When Joel came home for his first vacation, with the rush of a young colt that has had a good time in the corral but rejoices in the old pastures, his first cry was for Luke. When he learned where he was, he hurried to the bottling works. He was turned away with the curt remark, that employees could not be seen in business hours. In those days there were no machines to simplify and verify the bookkeeper's treadmill task, and business hours were never over. Joel left word at Luke's home for Luke to call for him the minute he was free. He did not come that evening nor the next. Joel was hurt more than he dared admit. It was Sunday afternoon before Luke came round, a different Luke, a lean, wan, worn-out shred of a youth. His welcome was sickly. "'Gee, Manently, Joel roared. "'I thought you was mad at me about something. "'You never came near.' "'I wanted to come,' Luke croaked. "'But nights I'm too tired to walk anywheres. "'And besides, I usually have to go back to the office.' "'Gee, that's damn tough,' said Joel, "'who had grown from darn to damn. "'Thinking to light Luke up with a congenial theme,' Joel heroically forbore to describe the marvels of academy life, and asked, "'What you been reading lately? A little bit of everything, I guess, eh?' "'A whole lot of nothing,' Luke sighed. "'I got no strength for reading by the time I shut my ledgers. "'I got to save my eyes, you know. The light's bad in that back room.' "'What you been writing, then?' "'Miles of figures and entries about one gross bottled lemon, two gross sassaprilla, one gross empties returned. No more poetry? No more nothing. Joel was obstinately cheerful. Well, you've been making money anyways. That's something. Yeah, I buy my own shoes and clothes now and pay my board and lodging at home. And Pa puts the two dollars that's left into the savings bank. I got nearly thirty dollars there now. I'll soon have enough for a winter suit and overcoat. "'Gee, can't you go buggy-riding even with Kit?' "'I could if I had the time and the price, "'and if her ma wasn't so poorly that Kitty can't get away. "'I go over there Sunday afternoons sometimes, "'but her ma always hollers for her to come in. "'She's afraid to be alone. 
Kit's had to give up the high school account of her ma. How about her going away to be a great singer? Luke grinned at the insanity of such childish plans. Oh, that's all off. Kit can't even practice any more. It makes her mother nervous. And Kit had to give up the church choir, too. You'd hardly know her. She cries a lot about looking so scrawny. Of course, I tell her she's prettier than ever, but that only makes her mad. She can't go to sociables or dances or picnics, and if she could, she's got no clothes. We don't have much fun together, just sit and mope, and then I say, well, guess I'd better mosey on home, and she says, all right, see you again next Sunday, I suppose. Goodbye. The nightingale annoyed the owl and was hushed, and the poet rhymed sums in a day book. The world waited for them and needed them without knowing it. It would have rewarded them with thrilled attention and wealth and fame, but silence was their portion, silence and the dark, and an ache that had no voice. Joel listened to Luke's elegy and groaned, Gee! But he had an optimism like a powerful spring, and it struck back now with a whirr. I'll tell you what, Luke, just you wait till I'm rich. Then I'll give you a job as vice president, and you can marry Kitty and live on Broadway in New York. I've got over believing in Sandy Claus, said Luke. Joel saw a little of him during this vacation, and less during the next. Being by nature a hater of despair, he avoided Luke. He had fits of remorse for this, and once he dared to make a personal appeal to old Mr. Mellows to send Luke away to school. He was received with scant courtesy, and only tolerated because he gave the father a chance to void some of his bile at the worthlessness of Luke. "'He's no good, that's what's the matter of him, and willful, too. He just mopes around because he wants to show me I'm wrong. But he's only cutting off his own nose to spite his face. I'll learn him who's got the most willpower.' Joel was bold enough to suggest, "'Maybe Luke would be different if you'd let him go to college.' "'You know, Mr. Mellows, if you'll excuse my saying it, "'there's some natures that are different from others. "'You hitch a racehorse up to a plough, "'and you spoil a good horse and your field both. "'Seems to me as if, if Luke got a chance to be a writer "'or a professor or something, he might turn out to be a wonder. "'You can't teach a canary bird to be a hen, you know, "'and Mr. Mellows locked himself in that ridiculous citadel of ancient folly. "'When you're as old as I am, Joel, you'll know more.' The first thing anybody's got to learn in this world is to respect their parents. Joel wanted to say, I should think that depended on the parents. But, of course, he kept silent, as the young usually do when they hear the old maundering, and he gave up as he heard the stupid dolt returning to his old refrain. I left school when I was twelve years old. Ain't had a day since, and I can't say as I've been exactly a failure. "'Best hardware store in Carthage and holding my own in spite of bad business.' "'Joel slunk away, unconvinced but baffled. "'One summer he brought all his pressure to bear on Luke "'to persuade him to run away from his job "'and strike out for the big city where the big opportunities grew. "'But Luke shook his head. He lacked initiative. "'Perhaps that was where his talent was not genius. "'It blistered him, but it made no steam.' Shakespeare had known enough to leave Stratford. He had had to hold horses outside the theatre, and even then he had organized a little business group of horse-holders called Shakespeare's Boys. He had the business sense, and he forced his way into the theatre and became a stockholder. Shakespeare was always an adventurer. He had to work in a butcher's shop, but before he was nineteen he was already married to a woman of twenty-six, and none too soon for the first child's sake. Luke Mellows had not the courage or the recklessness to marry Kitty, though he had as good a job as Shakespeare's. Shakespeare would not let a premature family keep him from his ambition. He was twenty-one when he went to London, but he went. London was a boom-town then, about the size of Trenton or Grand Rapids or Spokane, and growing fast. Boys were running away from the farms and villages, as they always have done, other boys went to London from Stratford. John Sadler became a big wholesale grocer, and Richard Field a publisher. They had as various reasons then as now. But the main thing was that they left home. 
That might mean a noble or a selfish ambition, but it took action. Luke Mellows would not go. He dreaded to abandon his mother to the father who bullied them both. He could not bear to leave Kitty alone with the wretched mother who ruled her with tears. Other boys ran or walked away from Carthage, some of them to become failures and some half-successes, and some of them to acquire riches and power, and other boys stayed at home. Girls, too, had won obscurity by inertia, or had swung into fame. Some of the girls had stayed at home and gone wrong there. Some had gone away in disgrace, and redeemed or damned themselves in larger parishes. There were Aspasias and Jones of Arc in miniature, minor Florence Nightingales and Melbas and Rosa Bonhurs. But they had all had to leap from the nest and try their wings. Of those that did not take the plunge, none made the flight." Cowardice held some back, but the purest self-sacrifice others. Joel felt that there ought to be a heaven for these latter, yet he hoped that there was no hell for the former. For who can save himself from his own timidity, and who can protect himself from his own courage? Given that little spur of initiative, that little armor of selfish indifference to the clinging hands at home, and how many a soul might not have reached the stars— Look at the women who were crowding the rolls of fame of late just because all womankind had broken free of the apron strings of alleged respectability. Joel had no proof that Luke Mellows would have amounted to much. Perhaps if he had ventured over the nest's edge he would have perished on the ground, trampled into dust by the fameward mob, or devoured by the critics that pounce upon every fledgling and suck the heart out of all that cannot fling them off. But Joel could not surrender his childhood faith that Luke Mellows had been meant for another Shakespeare. Yet Mellows had never written a play or an act of a play. But for that matter, neither had Shakespeare before he went to London. He was only a poet at first, and some of his poems were pretty poor stuff, if you took Shakespeare's name off it. And his first poems had to be published by his fellow townsman Field. There were the childish poems by Luke Mellows that Joel's father had published in the Carthage Clarion. Joel had forgotten them utterly, and they were probably meritorious of oblivion. But there was one poem Luke had written that Joel memorized. It appeared in the Clarion years after Joel was a success in wool. His father still sent him the paper, and in one number Joel was rejoiced to read these lines. The Anonymous by Luke Mellows Sometimes at night, within a wooded park, like an ocean cavern, fathoms deep in bloom, sweet scents, like hymns from hidden flowers, fume, and make the wanderer happy, though the dark obscures their tint, their name, their shapely bloom. So in the thick-set chronicles of fame there hover deathless feats of souls unknown. They linger like the fragrant smoke-wreaths blown from liberal sacrifice, gone face and name the deeds like homeless ghosts live on alone wixen seated in the boat on avon and lost in such dust that he could hardly see his hand upon the idle oar recited the poem softly to himself intoning it in the deep voice one saves for poetry it sounded wonderful to him in the luxury of hearing his own voice upon the water and indulging his own memory the sombre mood was perfect, in accord with the realm of shadow and silence where everything beautiful and living was cloaked in the general blur. After he had heard his voice chanting the last long o's of the final verse, he was ashamed of his solemnity, and terrified lest someone might have heard him and accounted him insane. He laughed at himself for a sentimental fool." He laughed, too, as he remembered what a letter of praise he had dictated to his astonished stenographer and fired off at Luke Mellows, and at the flippant letter he had in return. Lay readers who send incandescent epistles to poets are apt to receive answers in sardonic prose. The poet lies a little, perhaps, in a very sane suspicion of his own transcendencies. Luke Mellows had written, Dear old Joel, I sure am much obliged for your mighty handsome letter. Coming to one of the least successful wool-gatherers in the world from one of the most successful wool distributors 
It deserves to be highly prized, and is. I will have it framed and handed down to my heirs, of which there are more than there will ever be looms. You ask me to tell you all about myself. It won't take long. When the butterfly bottlery went bust, I had no job at all for six months, so I got married to spite my father, and to please Kit, whose poor mother ceased to suffer about the same time. The poor girl was so used to taking care of a poor old woman who couldn't be left alone that I became her patient just to keep all her talents from going to waste. The steady flow of children seems to upset the law of supply and demand, for there is certainly no demand for more of my progeny, and there is no supply for them, but somehow they thrive. I am now running my father's store, as the old gentleman had a stroke and then another. The business is going to pot as rapidly as you would expect, but I haven't been able to kill it off quite yet. Thanks for advising me to go on writing immortal poetry. If I were immortal, I might, but that fool thing was the result of about ten years' hard labor. I tried to make a sonnet of it, but I gave up at the end of the decade and called it whatever it is. Your father's paper published it free of charge, and so my income from my poetry has been one-tenth of nothing per annum. Please don't urge me to do any more. I really can't afford it. The poem was suggested to me by an ancient fit of blues over the fact that Kit's once so beautiful voice would never be heard in song, and by the fact that her infinite goodnesses will never meet any recompense or even acknowledgment. I was bitter the first five years, but the last five years I began to feel how rich this dark old world is in good, brave, sweet, lovable, heart-breakingly beautiful deeds that simply cast a little fragrance on the dark and are gone. They perfume the night, and the busy daylight dispels them like the morning mist that we used to watch steaming and vanishing above the old river. The Mississippi is still here, still rolling along its eternal multitudes of snows and flowers and fruits and fish and snakes and dead men and boats and trees. They go where they came from, I guess, in and out of nothing and back again. It is a matter of glory to all of us that you are doing so nobly. Keep it up and give us something to brag about in our obscurity. Don't worry. We are happy enough in the dark. We have our bat-like sports and our owl-like prides, and the full sun would blind us and lose us our way. Kit sends you her love and blushes as she says it. That is a very daring word for such shy moles as we are, but I will echo it. Yours for old sake's sake, Luke. Vaguely remembering this letter now, Joel inhaled a bit of the merciful chloroform that deadens the pain of thwarted ambition. The world was full of men and women like Luke and Kit. Some had given up great hopes because they were too good to tread others down in their quest. Some had quenched great talents because they were too fearsome or too weak or too lazy to feed their lamps with oil and keep them trimmed and alight. Some had stumbled through life darkly, with no gifts of talent, without even appreciation of the talents of others, or of the flower-like beauties that star the meadows. Those were the people he had known. And then there were the people he had not known, the innumerable caravan that had passed across the earth while he lived, the inconceivable hosts that had gone before, tribe after tribe, generation upon generation, nation at the heels of nation, cycle on era on age, and the backward perpetuity from everlasting unto everlasting. People, people, peoples, poor souls, until the thronged stars that make a dust of the Milky Way were a lesser mob. Here in this graveyard at Stratford lay men who might have overtopped Shakespeare's glory if they had but had a mind to. Some of them had been held in higher esteem in their town, but they were forgotten, their names leveled with the surface of their fallen tombstones. Had he not cried out in his own hamlet, O oh God, I could be bounded in a nutshell and count myself a king of infinite space, were it not that I have bad dreams, which dreams indeed are ambition, for the very substance of the ambitious is merely the shadow of a dream, and I hold ambition of so airy and light a quality that it is but a shadow's shadow. 
After all, the greatest of men were granted but a lesser oblivion than the least, and in that overpowering thought there was a strange comfort, the comfort of misery finding itself in an infinite company. The night was thick upon Avon. The swans had gone somewhere. The lights in the houses had a sleepy look. It was time to go to bed. Joel yawned with the luxury of having wearied his heart with emotion. He had thought himself out for once. It was good to be tired. He put his oars into the stream, and dipping up reflected stars sent them swirling in a doomsday chaos after him with the defiant revenge of a proud soul who scorns the universe that grinds him to dust. The old boatman was surly with waiting. He did not thank the foreigner for his liberal largeness, and did not answer his good night. As Wixon left the river and took the road for his hotel, the nightingale, that forever anonymous nightingale, only one among the millions of forgotten or throttled songsters, revolted for a moment or two against the stifling doom, and shattered it with a wordless sonnet of fierce and beautiful protest. The tawny-throated, what triumph, hark, what pain! It was as if Luke Mellows had suddenly found expression in something better than words, something that any ear could understand, an ache that rang. Wixon stopped, transfixed as by flaming arrows. He could not understand what the bird meant, or what he meant, nor could the bird, but as there is no laughter that eases the heart like unpacking it of its woes in something beyond wording, so there is nothing that brightens the eyes like tears gushing without shame or restraint. Joel Wixon felt that it was a good, sad, mad world, and that he had been very close to Shakespeare, so close that he heard things nobody had ever found the phrases for, things that cannot be said but only felt, and transmitted rather by experience than by expression from one proud worm in the mud to another. End of The Stick in the Muds by Rupert Hughes The Wedding This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Lucy Burgoyne. The Wedding by Jenny Betts Hartswick Well, it's over. It's all over. Being the last to leave, I know that. And I declare, I'm that full of all the things we had to eat that John and me won't want any supper for a good hour yet. "'so I just ran in to tell you about it while it's on top of my mind. "'It's an everlasting shame you had to miss it. "'One thing, though, you'll get a tray full of the good things sent in to you. "'I shouldn't wonder. I know there's loads left, "'for I happened to slip out to the kitchen for a drink of water. "'I was that dry after all those salty nuts, "'and I didn't want to trouble them, "'and I saw just heaps of things standing round. Most likely you'll get a good, large plate of cake, not just a pinchin' little mite of a piece in a box. The boxes are real pretty, though, and they did look real palatial, all stacked up on a table by the front door, with a strange-coloured man in white gloves like a pool-bearer, to hand them to you. How did I get two of them? Why, it just happened that way. You see, when I was leaving, I missed my sunshade and I laid my box down on the hat-rack stand while I went upstairs to look for it. I went through all the rooms, and just when I'd about given it up, why, there it was, right in my hand all the time. Wasn't it foolish? And when I came downstairs, I found I'd clean forgot where I'd laid the box of cake. I hunted everywhere, and when I just had to tell the man how twas so he handed me another one, and I was just walking out the front door when, would you believe it, if there wasn't the other one, just as innocent, on the hat-rack stand where I had laid it. So now I have three of them, counting John's. I just can't seem to realise that Eleanor Jameson is married at last. Can you? She took her time, if ever anybody did. 
They do say she was real taken with that young college professor with the full beard and spectacles that visited there last summer, and then to think that, after all, she went and married a man with a smooth face. He wears glasses, though. That's one point in common. Eleanor's gone off a good deal lately. Don't you think so? You hadn't noticed it. But then you never was any great hand at noticing. I've noticed you weren't. Why, the other day when I was there offering to help em get ready for the wedding, I noticed that she looked real worn, and there was two or three little fine lines in her eye corners, not real wrinkles, of course, but we all know that lines is a forerunner. Her hair's beginning to turn too. I noticed that coming out of church last Sunday. I dare say her knowing this made her less particular than she'd once had been. And after all, marrying any husband is a good deal like buying a new black silk dress pattern. An awful risk. You may look at it on both sides and hold it up to the light and pull it to see if it'll fray and try if it'll spot. "'but you can't be sure what it'll do "'till after you've worn it a spell. "'There's one advantage to the dress pattern, though. "'You can make em take it back "'if you mistrust it won't wear, "'if you haven't cut into it. "'That is, but when you've got a husband, "'why, you've got him to have and to hold, "'for better and worse, and good and all. "'Yes, I'm coming to the wedding, I declare.' When I think how careless Eleanor is about little things, I can't help mistrusting what kind of a housekeeper she'll turn out. Why, when John's and my invitation came, it was only printed to the church. There wasn't any reception card among it. Now, I've supplied Eleanor's folks with butter and eggs and spring chickens for thirty years, and I'd just have gone anyway, for I knew it was a mistake. But John held out that twasn't and they didn't mean to have us to the house part. So, to settle it, I went right over and told em. I told Eleanor she mustn't feel put out about it. We was all mortal, and if it hadn't been for satisfying John, I'd never have let her know how careless she'd been. Of course, I'd made allowance. A wedding is upsetting to the intellect, and so twas all right. I had a real good view of the ceremony, but twasn't their fault that I had. It just happened that way. When John and me got there, I asked the young man at the door, he was a yusher and a stranger to me, to give us a front seat, but he said that all the front places was reserved for the relations of the bride and groom, and then I noticed that they tied off the middle aisle about seven pews back, with white satin ribbons and a big bunch of pink roses. It seemed real impolite to invite folks to a wedding and then take the best seats themselves. Well, just then I happened to feel my shoelacing getting loose, and I stepped to one side to fix it, and when I got up from stooping and my gloves on and buttoned, I had to take em off to tie my shoe, and straighten John's cravat for him. Why, there was the families on both sides just going in. Of course we had to follow right along behind em, and when we came up to the ribbons, would you believe it, the big bow just untied itself, or seemed to. I heard afterward it was done by somebody pulling a invisible wire, and we all walked through and took seats. I made John go into the pew ahead of me, so's I could get out without disturbing anybody, if I should have a headache or feel faint. When John found we were settin' with the family, he was right close up against Eleanor's mother. He was for getting up and movin' back, but I just whispered to him, John Appleby, do sit still. I hear the bridal party comin'. Of course, I didn't just hear em, but I was sure they'd be along in a minute, and I knew it wouldn't do to move our seats anyway, as if we weren't satisfied with them. The church was decorated beautiful. Eleanor's folks must have cleaned out their greenhouse to put into it, besides tons of greens from the city. Pretty near the whole of Renville was there, and I must say the church was a credit to the Renville dressmakers. 
I could pick out all their different fits without any trouble. There was Arabella Satterley's. She shapes her backs like the top of a coffin, or sometimes they remind me more of a kite. And Sally Ann Hodds, she makes them square, and old Mrs. Tucker's. You can always tell hers by the way the armholes draw. She makes the minister's wives. But they'd every one of them done their level best and was proud of them. Well, when the organ, it had been playing low and soft all the time, changed off into the wedding march, and the bridesmaids, eight of them, marched up the aisle behind the eight yushes. I tell you, Miss Halliday, it was a sight. They was all in pink gauzy stuff. I happened to feel one of them as she went by, but I couldn't tell what t'was made of. It seemed dreadful flimsy, and big flat hats all made of roses on their heads, and carrying bunches of puff long stem roses, so big that they had to hold them in their arms like young babes. Eleanor came behind them all, walking with her father. He always was a small built man, and with her long trail and her veil spreading out so, why, I declare, you couldn't hardly see him. I whispered to John that they looked more as if Eleanor was going to give her pa away than him her. Eleanor's dress was elegant, only awful plain. It was made in New York at Greenleaf's. I know, because when I was upstairs looking for my sunshade, I told you about that, didn't I? I happened to get into Eleanor's room by mistake, and there was the box that came in right on the bed before my eyes. Well, when they was all past, I kept looking round me for the groom and wondering how I had come to miss him, when all at once John nudged me. And there he was, right in front of me, and the minister beginning to marry him. And where he had sprung from, I can't tell you this livid minute. Came in from the vestry, did he? Well, now, I never would have thought of that. Well, when they was most married, the most ridiculous thing happened. You see, Eleanor's father, in stepping back after giving her away, had put his foot right down on her trail and never noticed. And when it came time for the prayer, Eleanor pulled and pulled. They was to kneel down on two big white satin cushions in front of them. But her pa never budged, just stood there with his eyes shut and his head bowed as devout as anything. And before Eleanor could stop him, her husband, he was most her husband anyway, had knelt right down onto the cushion and his eyes shut too. I suppose, and the minister had to pray over him that way. I could see Eleanor's shoulders shaking under her veil, and of course it was ridiculous if it hadn't been so solemn. And then they all marched down the aisle, with the bride and groom leading the procession. Eleanor's veil was put back, and I noticed that she was half laughing yet, and her cheeks were real pink, and her eyes sort of bright and moist. She looked real handsome. Good gracious, Miss Halliday, don't ever tell me that's six o'clock. And I haven't told a thing about the presents, and who was there, and Eleanor's clothes, and what they had to eat. Why, they didn't even use their own chinaware. They had a coloured caterer from New York, and he brought everything. All the dishes and tablecloths and spoons and forks, besides the refreshments. I know, because just after he came, I happened to carry over my eleven best forks. John broke the dozenth, trying to pry the cork out of a bottle of raspberry vinegar the year we were married. I never take a fork to pry with, and offered to loan em for the wedding, but they didn't need em. So I just stayed a minute or two in the butler's pantry, and then went home. But I saw the caterer unpacking. There! I knew I'd stay too long. There's John coming in the gate after me. I must go this blessed minute. End of the Wedding by Jenny Betts Hartswick